and uh, do the hosted Q&A. So as always, you can go on Slido. I will pop that link in Discord as well, uh, and we'll have the QR code that comes up, and you can um, add questions from now uh, as the speakers talk, and then um, they will kick in uh, after the talks. So our moderator is Pierre-Marc Pirot. Uh, he's a longtime NorthSec volunteer with more than 15 years of experience in information security. Uh, il est responsable de, de la sous-équipe de TAG qui se concentre sur les attaques informatiques motivées financièrement. Son équipe et lui sont basés à Montréal et il se spécialise en rétro-ingénierie et analyse de code malveillant. Uh, so that was, that was very bilingual. Awesome. Impressive. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. So uh, I will introduce our first speaker, Suira, who uh, has been doing malware analysis and reverse engineering for the last 10 years. In addition to that, she's also volunteering in her community, both participating in Cyber Agilis and Black Foodie. So welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, hello NorthSec. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk about my research on tracking bumblebee development. Uh, as you know, my name is Sue and I'm sitting here in Fort Pierre Park. So our talk today, we are going to look at different timelines on the development of different bumblebee components. Um, so it may not be apparent right now, what we'll notice is that the developers, they like to focus on different EDR evasion techniques, some of which are worth mentioning. So we'll talk about those as well. And then finally at the end, we'll draw a conclusion about what these timelines can teach us about the, deve the developers and how they approach uh, developer and analytics. I do want to note that CalSec's name for the malware as seen in the intelligence reporting is called Fingers but I will continue to use uh, Bumblebee throughout this talk. So before we're going to look at dev timelines, we're going to first get a really quick history about Bumblebee. So quick, uh, just a quick chronology timeline here. So how did it all start? So it was first reported in March 2022 by the Google TAG team. Uh, the researchers, they observed uh, this uh, new loader being used by affiliates who were previously associated with Conti. Um, and that's also how they gave it its name. The string Bumblebee was seen in a user agent header when it made requests to the server. Now these same affiliates, they used a similar loader in a campaign they were targeting in August of 2021. Uh, that's the CVE they were targeting. And it was later reported by Microsoft in September of that year. Uh, but that loader though, it didn't have the bot-like capabilities. It was only used for threading cobalt strike. So when we're looking at our timelines, we are going to focus on Bumblebee when it started off as a bot. So the start date we believe to be 31st Jan 2022, and for the purpose of this research, it's until 1st of March this year. So as you see here, shortly after the first report, uh, Bumblebee's activity started picking up. Three major affiliates were even seen using it from the beginning. Um, more major affiliates joined down the line, and there were some smaller ones, but it's not shown here in the graph. Uh, and you also see that they're used by the likes, uh, distributed by the likes of Smokebot and Batloader. So it's quite a popular malware. So what is Bumblebee like uh, right now when it infects a victim's machine? Like, what does that life cycle look like? So as with most malware, it starts off with the loader the way bot. Uh, top there you see in the flow. Uh, it's uh, encrypted, it's packed, it unpacks our malware. In Bumblebee's case, the unpacked file is always a DLL. 
Uh, so once unpacked, it can communicate with the server to receive commands that it needs to run on the machine. Uh, Bumblebee calls these commands as tasks. They are abbreviated, three-lettered strings, and they're lettered in such a way that you can deduce the meaning behind each task. So take, for instance, the one at the very bottom here, SDL, stands for silent, delete. It, it's, uh, yeah, so it removes, malware removes itself from the machine. I won't go through this list yet because we will touch on tasks again at a later point. Now, I'll unpack DLL2. Uh, it has another embedded file in it. It's called a hook module. It's used in conjunction with two of the tasks, and we'll see that later on in the talk as well. Uh, and finally, uh, Bumblebee is modular in nature. That means it can uh, run different plugins on the machine that it gets from the server. And those plugins, too, can communicate with the server. Uh, so from this image, we are looking at three different timelines. Our first timeline will look at the development that's been put into the loader and the DLL. Uh, the second one, you know, changes that we have seen to the communication protocol over time. And then finally, the third timeline is just going to look at tasks. So here we have is our first GAND timeline chart. Uh, so the way it works is uh, from left to right, it goes in chronological order. So starting from 31st Jan 2022 until 1st of March this year. And from top to bottom, you can see uh, the list of techniques that uh, the malware uses in, uh, in part of its loader or its bot. Uh, I didn't list all those techniques here because it would be impossible to fit it all in the slide. Uh, but this is just to give you an idea of how long those techniques were used and the duration. Now, before I talk about you know, this uh, timeline here, I do want to mention about Bumblebee's binaries uh, just in general. So Bumblebee's main DLL, the unpacked file, and its plugins, they use, you'll notice they use a lot of functions from the Boost library. Boost is an open source C++ library. It is header-based. That means any program using Boost ends up statically compiling a lot of those functions in its binary. And it also explains why Bumblebee's files are quite big in size. So as you see here from the start, when Bumblebee started, it didn't have a loader. It was actually quite, it didn't have anything packing. It was unencrypted, it was unpacked. Uh, this now might likely be, it's um, like a way for the developers uh, to test the bot. Uh, and the loader actually came much later into play by end of March. And as we saw in the previous timeline, it was around the time the malware was picking up activity. So despite, you know, even though they were just testing the malware, they did, though, have what we believe to be an EDR evasion technique. Uh, so this technique was where it would hook the API RTL exit user process. So the API was only hooked if there was an existing EDR or AV hook on that API. In this case, the malware's trampling code would make sure that Bumblebee finished executing its thread before control went back to the EDR, likely to prevent uh, you know, the antivirus from scanning or analyzing the process any further. They did, though, swap this technique for another EDR evasion called thread execution hijacking by end of June 2022. Um, I think, yeah. Uh, but in my opinion, a much better EDR evasion. Uh, we'll see why in a later slide. Now, when the loader was introduced, it wasn't only like used for encrypting a packer, uh, I mean a DLL, it too had an EDR evasion. It's called remote library injection. And that too we'll see again right after this slide. The developers as well, they played with a different form of a loader. Uh, and, and in fact, it also gave them another EDR evasion. So they would use Powersploit's reflective DLL injection. And this was something they introduced after they came back from their first break. Uh, but now we see it more uh, when they came back from their second break. And it's more used in cases for SEO poisoning and malvertising. Finally, I want to touch on Alkazer. So Alkazer is this repository in GitHub. It contains all these different techniques and one can use for doing anti-analysis checks on the machine. Uh, and Bumblebee uses almost all of those checks. And so they were using the Alkazer repo quite aggressively, like at the beginning of the malware's execution. And as you can see, like for a really long period of time, uh, but then 
interestingly, they just dropped it like two weeks before going on their second break. It wasn't really clear why, uh, but then after coming back from their second break, they, they reintroduced it, but in a completely different context. So we'll see that more when we look at the C2 communication. Now, if we have our first EDR evasion here. This is used by the loader. So the purpose of this technique is to actually masquerade Bumblebee's unpacked DLL to appear running as a legitimate DLL in memory. Uh, here you see is a screenshot of Process Explorer. You can see the active threads of Bumblebee's process. The one highlighted there, the active thread, it's pointing to this library called DIMS ROM. It's actually a Windows uh, system library of Windows. Now, it's, in this case, it's not the system library that's running behind the scenes, it's actually Bumblebee. Uh, the one giveaway here is it's referencing that export function called setpath. That belongs to our malware. Now, this technique is done by first hooking APIs that are used by NTDLL for loading and mapping libraries in memory. Uh, generally, those APIs perform their operation against a file on disk. But by hooking the API, they can control it against an unpacked file in memory. So quite clever. Uh, but this you know, proof of concept isn't new. It was introduced back in 2004, and there's a link to it at the bottom uh, for those that can see the slide, <laughs> um, and uh, which goes into detail explaining it. And, and also, the only other malware that we were able to find using the same, the same technique was Ramnet. And it's also pointed out in one of IBM's blogs. Now, this is not all to say that you know, the developers were necessarily aware of the POC or were the same group as Ramnet. But it's quite common in eCrime to see a lot of these groups borrow techniques and reuse techniques and um, yeah, so it's nothing necessarily new, but it seems to work for their case. Next off, we have is the thread execution hijacking. So this is the EDR evasion used by our unpacked DLL. Now this technique's purpose is to masquerade Bumblebee's start offset in memory to appear under a decoy offset. And, and they point that offset to that of this really long named API that's part of NTDLL. Uh, so similarly, you have the same screenshot here, and you have one of these other active threads. It's showing that the API is running, but uh, as you can guess, it's actually a malware. Now, this technique is done by first, uh, it creates the API as a thread in suspended mode, and when the thread is suspended, the malware can modify the thread's context structure. In that structure, there's a field that specifies a start routine, it would normally point to the API, it just swaps it for the malware. So it effectively just spoofs the EDR's call stack, so it appears that an API is running, but actually it's the malware that's running behind the scenes. Now this technique is generally used for process injection, and there's a really good entry in MITRE ATT&CK that shows other malware families using it. Um, in my case, I was trying to find a similar POC where it's used in within the same process because it wasn't really injected into any external process. I had no luck. I actually thought this was something novel by this group, but then I come across this other blog where they show Cozy Bear's uh, Dropbox loader using the same technique, and coincidentally, they use the same decoy API name, so of all the API names that could be out there. Uh, so again, you know, clearly they borrowed uh, another technique here. Now that we've learned about the loader and DLL, let's look at the C2 communication. Um, so before I show the timeline, I just want to explain what uh, Bumblebee's protocol is like right now. Uh, so the malware uses secure web sockets. Uh, the messages it creates to the, for the server and receives from the server, they are in JSON format and they are RC4 encrypted, the key of which is embedded in our unpacked DLL file. Here's a description of what these messages look like. They're very truncated. It's not the full version, but just to give a sense of what it is. And I've labeled them as ping, hit, and task, just to understand and the flow better as I explain it. But these are not the names given by the malware. <coughs> now, Bumblebee, uh, they have a beaconing style communication. So these messages you see, they get sent in a loop constantly. 
Uh, this is quite common in a lot of e-crime families. You see it also with bot bots and CAC bots. And, uh, so the payload is not immediately delivered to the victim machine. It's delivered at an undetermined period of time. So that makes it harder for analysts like us to pull down any payload and also makes it just harder for the victim to realize that they were infected. Um, now, so let's explain what these messages mean. Uh, so now the whole point of Bumblebee's ping request is to send across the bot's ID to the server and in turn from the server it will get a session ID. That session ID is used in throughout the other request messages and likely it's for the malware's back end to keep track of what messages get sent out. And finally, if there's any commands for the malware to execute, it'll arrive in the task type response message. And as you learn, task is the three-lettered command and along with any payload for the malware to execute. Now, what about the hit request here in the middle? That is where Alcazar comes into play. So Alcazar, as we learned from the first timeline, you know, is this repo on GitHub contains different te techniques one can do for anti-analysis checks. Well, uh, Bumblebee don't do those checks at the beginning of execution. Now, uh, they will run those checks only when it receives the go-to from the server. That go-to is in the ping response. There's a Boolean field in there called hit. If the server sends the hit value is true, it will run these checks and then it will send um, you know, the, out, the results of those checks in this really long JSON message uh, contains different Boolean fields across to the server. And accordingly, the server will drop the connection if it thinks there's any, if it's running in a VM or any anti-analysis artifacts. Um, now the developers, they didn't only settle with using Alcazo, they do some of their own checks, uh, like the classic, trying to look for active processes in the machine. And, and this one in particular, uh, this field here called binary DB. That one contains a base64 encoded SQL database of browsing history that they query from Chrome and MS Edge in particular. So now you have a really clever way of checking like if your machine is indeed a sandbox or a victim, because a you know, sandbox is less likely to have browsing history. I do want to note that now we see these new builds in April uh, where this check has been dropped, but not completely because we still see affiliates using older builds. So not every communication will necessarily be exfiltrating browsing history. Now, in the event that Bumblebee gets a task from the server, it will, it will also send a, a result of running the task in a separate uh, type message. Sorry, it's right behind me here. <laughs> Um, and that just contains you know, any errors that may have been encountered by running the task or um, any information that was exfiltrated by running the task. So looking at uh, the timeline, there's actually been quite a fair bit of changes over time till it got to where it is now. Uh, it's a bit harder to follow, so I found that just by grouping it on these certain properties here, uh, again, right behind me, <laughs> Um, it makes it a bit more easier to follow. So let's uh, go from the beginning at the start. So when Bumblebee first started, they used actually an HTTPS protocol. And of course, it's infamous user agent string Bumblebee. Uh, now the messages that were sent across, it was only the task message, so not the ping and the hit that we saw in the previous slide. Um, the client version number was one, you know, of course, first iteration. And the endpoint string that it made a request to was called gate. Now by mid-April, they decided to randomize the user agent pattern. I, and this was also the time you started seeing more public blogs coming out about Bumblebee. And Bumblebee was a bit too obvious <laughs> of a user agent name. Uh, but that was clearly short-lived because in early May, they decided to uh, switch it up. So they randomized the user agent. Uh, they uh, started encrypting the task message and see RC4 keys come and play. Uh, the endpoint string, uh, it changed from gate to gate S. S may be their way of saying secure, no idea. Um, and then, uh, okay, so now the next stage. Uh, so a month after they came from their first break, uh, they switched the protocol. This is now where they started using WebSockets. Uh, and we also see the introduction of the ping type message. Uh, the endpoint string, change from gate S to gate W, and the client version number was two. Uh, and now where we are at, and something they've introduced after their second break is, you know, we see the three messages, 
the only difference is the usage and string is this hard-coded value here, the bottom of the slide. Uh, it's not randomized anymore. And maybe it's like the attempt at trying to make traffic look a bit more legitimate. That brings us to the final one, tasks. Uh, so here on the left-hand side, uh, okay, the screen is like gone off here. <laughs> but on the left-hand side, you can see is a description of what the three-letter tasks mean. And on the right-hand side is a really high-level overview on how they get executed by the malware. Now, our first four tasks are what are responsible for executing payloads, the first three of which does, uh, injects the payload into processes. So Bumblebee can either inject shell codes or a DLL. And if it is uh, DLL, it could be either secondary payloads in the DLL format, so like COBOL Strike, BarkBot, or, or it could be DLLs, uh, oh, they're plugins, which are also in the DLL format. Uh, now, if it's injecting payloads, it uses the APC Q code injection technique, and it's also injected along with the hook module, both of which have an EDR evasion role behind it, so I will expand on them um, at a later slide. Now, Bumblebee can execute uh, payloads just by itself, uh, no injection needed, that's the DEX task. Uh, GDT allows the malware to run commands, uh, likely for reconnaissance, uh, you know, instead of invoking it directly through command.exe, it's passed to command.exe standard input output. Uh, nothing malicious, it's actually a common programming technique, but it just uh, prevents the user from getting notified that these commands are running in the background. Uh, the malware can install itself on the machine, aka create persistence. It uses uh, WMI to do create those artifacts. And finally, SDL, silent delete, uh, the malware can remove itself uh, and it uses PowerShell to do that. And uh, now we have our final timeline. Uh, so let's start off with the persistence task install, uh, ints. So now, when this task was used in the beginning, it didn't use WMI, it used your regular Windows API, like uh, create directory, you know, to create those uh, artifacts on the machine. Uh, the switch to WMI came about early May, and it was actually quite a clever shift. Because now it will create those persistence files uh, using command line strings. But uh, with WMI, uh, it, could, it would create the, yeah, it would create a command.exe using WMI. A result of doing that ends up showing command.exe's process as a child process of the WMI parent process rather than of the malware's process. So effectively, they achieve parent PID spoofing. So quite clever, and it's a bit more harder to monitor. Now, this same task, uh, the way it is implemented to deferred based on which loader is being used. So as we learned in the first timeline, you know, it's either a uh, power exploit, so it starts off as a PowerShell file, or it could be an encrypted loader. So if it, if it was using power exploit, um, the malware just uses Windows DP API to encrypt the contents of the file. So this likely prevents antivirus from scanning the contents and, you know, and being like, oh, whoa, this looks like PowerShell <laughs> like commands and from blocking it. Uh, then accordingly, Bumblebee creates a task that will run a script which uses DP API to decrypt it before running. Now if the loader was you know, an executable to start off with, it was already encrypted, already packed, it didn't need DP API, and then you know, just used a living off the land binary, ODPC conf, to execute the DLL. Next off we have is GDT, the one that can execute commands. Uh, they introduced this in early May as well. Uh, it, was a pre it was implemented pretty s uh, in a simple manner. Uh, in fact, it was so simple that it matched exactly that with uh, MSDN's uh, example uh, on how to achieve the same uh, technique. Uh, but it only allowed them to run one command at a time. Uh, so it, I wasn't aware that they were testing it, but then by end of May, they switched. They started using boost.asio uh, library to implement the same technique. The only difference with using Boost was it allowed them to run multiple commands asynchronously. Um, so here you see is just a screenshot of what the pipe name gets created as a result of using boost.asio. So not malicious again, but quite useful for hunting. 
And also at the end of the name, you'll see concatenated to it is the PID. So it's the process that invoked this uh, technique to start up with. And then finally, let's touch on PLG, uh, the task. Uh, so PLG is what allowed, uh, which introduced plugins for the malware, yeah. And that was also introduced around the time they switched to WebSocket. So they made quite a big changes after their first break. Um, nothing too fancy, but they needed a way to get the plugins to communicate with the bots, and so they created an RPC endpoint via named pipes that allows for inter-process communication. Nothing malicious, uh, popular programming technique, uh, but um, you know, it's just useful to be aware of. Um, now, the plugins via this endpoint, they can, uh, they can query for the active C2 address. Fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, for the active C2 address and port that they need to connect to. Okay. So I'll try and go as quickly as I can. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk on this injection technique that's used by tasks. So APC is actually getting quite popular uh, among malware authors, and there's a MITRE attack at the bottom of the slide, if you can see it, <laughs> uh, that lists other families using it. Um, so why is this popular? So every thread in a process has an APC, it's a queue. Anything, that's ad and anything that gets added to that queue is executed when the thread, uh, thread enters an alertable state. So uh, Bumblebee, as you can tell, and most other malware families, they like to take advantage of this. So in Bumblebee's case, they'll just create the process in the suspended mode, inject the payload, and add an offset to the payload to the thread's APC queue. So then as the thread is, as the process is resumed, it ends up executing the code. Uh, and also they uh, modify the entry point of the process by adding instructions that call sleepx in the loop, because sleepx helps to uh, set the thread into that state, into the alertable state. And in addition, these uh, processes are created with WMI, and as we've learned, achieves parent PID spoofing. <coughs> Uh, next off is the hook module that's injected along with the DLLs. The, so the purpose of this is, uh, module is to remove EDR hooks on APIs. Uh, it comes with a list of hard-coded APIs in the binary and it looks through all those APIs. So it compares uh, those APIs instructions in memory to its instructions on this physical uh, file on disk because uh, AV is likely to hook on an API more in memory. It doesn't hook it in disk. Uh, so it compares it using a length disassembler, which uh, calculates the length of each instruction, and it also compares the prefix. Uh, and accordingly, you know, if the length or prefix is different, it means it's hooked, in which case it just copies over the bytes in the physical file to, the, um, to its instructions in memory, effectively removing the hook. Uh, finally, it uses remote library injection to load the payload uh, to appear running as a legitimate DLL. So this was the very same technique used by the loader as well. So I'll quickly expand on this, uh, the, the function that uses uh, uh, the, cr the length disassembler function. It borrows a lot from this open source library called Lipsplice. I just wanted to point out it's quite popular among other families that have been seen. Uh, and again, just to show that, you know, it's nothing something they've implemented on their own and they're just using some existing code out there. And that finally brings us to our conclusion, you know, speed mode. <laughs> uh, so what do these timelines teach us? So from these timelines, uh, it helps us to map uh, the activity of Bumblebee's software development lifecycle. So clearly, the developers, they have an agile methodology with how they go about building this uh, malware. Uh, so in the, we see that right off from the beginning, especially that period in the start, 31st Jan until 31st March 2022, that was, uh, you know, the first release of our malware. It was quite simple. It didn't have the loader, wasn't encrypted and packed. And this in agile terms would be called an MVP, which is a minimal viable product. And that's where, you know, they're testing out. You'll also see this in a lot of forums, underground forums, uh, when authors are trying to sell their malware product, they're like, they have some beta version or an MVP version, and it's kind of hilarious, it's kind of like they're crowdfunding for getting their malware project off the ground. Um, but not to say that we saw the same activity with Bumblebee, but just by observing the builds over time, you can see this, uh, you can 
imagine what that's like. And it's also clear because the second phase of uh, their release was what introduced EDR evasion. And that was uh, you know, at the end of March when they introduced the loader and it also had an EDR evasion and we even see three major affiliates using it. And it makes sense because if you're going to make your malware live, you wanna make sure that it's not detectable. Now apart from all of that, uh, we also noticed that these developers, they like to focus on the C2 infrastructure during the hiatus. Uh, in our heads, we think of hiatus as a break, but no, <laughs> they are not on a break. They're on a break from distributing the malware. Uh, this makes sense because if they're going to um, you know, uh, sp um, build a new malware, they wanna make sure that it's able to communicate with a back end that works. And so it makes sense why they're going on a break. And I believe right now they're probably on their third break because I haven't seen much activity. Uh, the developers too, they seem to step out of the norm with how they've gone building out this uh, malware. We don't see the use of API hashing or string obfuscation that's actually quite common. Now that might likely be the result of how they're using EDR evasion. So as we saw with the loader and with our DLL, it uh, spoofs the EDR's call stack. It makes it appear that our malware is running as a DLL or as an API. Uh, so you know, if your antivirus doesn't think that uh, that memory space is malicious because it thinks it's a DLL or API, it's less likely to scan it, and then YAR rules at this case at this point would be quite useless. Um, and then finally, you know, they clearly have some mature dev practices on how they go about doing things, especially the fact that they're using Boost. Boost, you know, it's, it's open source, but it's very popular in the C++ community, but it's not commonly seen in malware and uh, used for building malware. There are a few out there, but not common. You don't even see them used in game cheats. And, and you can guess why, it's quite big in size and quite bulky. But the fact that this is mature is because they're clearly familiar with something that is quite common for a community and they use it. I mean, they communicate with the C2 and with the, in the GDT task command. And also the fact that they're using the open source library LibSplice that's quite common in splicing. You know, it's been around for almost a decade. Uh, and it makes sense. Like if you're going to modify an API in memory, you better know what you're doing. So might as well use something that works and is quite capable to achieve the task. Uh, so yeah, that's about it. Hope you all enjoyed and I look forward to questions during the panel. Thank you. Thanks everyone. We will start again in roughly five minutes. So if you want to change rooms or even move a bit forward in the room so that you leave uh, more space for others coming in. See you in five minutes.
running for, for about a week. And they give more detail and say that uh, there was a malicious uh, attachment with a macro, and then it led to a lua based malware dub sensitive. So according to our visibility, most high-profile targets for this cyber espionage campaign were located uh, in Eastern Europe, around Ukraine, and we noticed that the group was especially interesting, interested in diplomats and people working at Ministry of Foreign Affairs in various countries in this region. So here are examples of malicious documents that the group has used. So the one of on, on the left is uh, used some traditional VBA macro, while the one on, on the right that was used, if I remember correctly, in June 2022 um, against um, government staff of Moldova. Uh, so this one was using the Folina vulnerability, which is CV 2022-30190. So it's a vulnerability that leads to code execution in, in Microsoft Office. And this one was discovered just few few weeks before it was used. Um, so it it shows that Azalea Mombuscade is like looking for, for new for new compromise vector. So what's the infection chain? First it starts with a spear phishing email. Um, as I just shown, then it's a malicious office document, for example, XLS attachment with a VBA macro. That then download a MSI installer that will drop the sunset downloader, which is a Lua base, Lua, Lua base downloader, and then the persistence is established by dropping a LNK file in the startup folder. But the, the chain doesn't stop there. So sunset is a downloader and can download additional scripts in, in Lua, and one of those scripts uh, is responsible for downloading the next stage which is more or less the same thing as Sunset, but in auto uh, So it's, again, a downloader in auto -hotkey. And it, the, this time, this one can download uh, spying pr plugins, also in auto -hotkey. So for example, to take screenshots, to steal password in browser, or some kind of uh, hidden VNC. And there are many more. So this is Sunseed, it's a bit ugly, but uh, once you deobfuscate it um, with a bit of manual work, this is what you, what you obtain. So it's quite simple. First it takes the serial number of the C drive, and then it uh, sends a HTTP uh, GET request to the CNC server. Um, so there is an IP address of the C2 that is directly had coded in the code, and then it's a uh, slash and the serial number that was retrieved. And then the, re the reply of this request um, is Lua code that will be interpreted. So this is uh, uh, the, the plugin that will drop the auto key uh, downloader. So it's Lua script that will just down download first this uh, uh, mscore.ehk uh, uh, file, so this is the auto-hotkey script, and then second, it downloads the auto-hotkey interpreter, because most of the time the victim doesn't have the auto-hotkey interpreter installed on their machine, so they, they need to ship it. And this group really like scripting language. For example, they develop a variant of Sunseed in TCL. It was the first time I heard about uh, the, the script language. But as you can see, it's almost the same thing, except that uh, it doesn't retrieve the C drive serial number, but the logic is similar. Like it's send request to a server and eval the reply. So this is uh, the auto key downloader. Um, as you can see, it's almost the same as Sunseed again. Um, yeah. First, uh, it will take the C drive serial number which is put then in the HTTP uh, request, and then it evals uh, the code that it's written by, by the CNC server. This is an example of a uh, plugin in auto -hotkey. This one will install a, a remote access tool, which is called uh, remote, uh, remote Utilities, so it's kind of a legitimate tool. 
um, but it allows to like to fully control uh, the machine. So actually, like this AutoHotKey script just uh, download and execute the uh, execute app for remote utilities. This is the full list of plugins that is available to AHKBot. So I won't describe every every single of them, uh, but maybe just. Just a few, so there is a desk screen plugin to take a screenshot. Desk screen on, desk screen off is to take screenshot in loop. Um, then we have this HVNC. So HVNC stands for hidden VNC, but actually in this case it's not really, a, it doesn't use the VNC protocol. It's just a headless uh, Chrome browser that can be controlled remotely. Um, not sure what the exact purpose, but it might be to browse websites that are not available uh, uh, from like the out. I mean, to, to browse um, uh, website on the intranet or on the local network. Uh, since they don't have any proxy, uh, maybe it's like their way of proxying, proxying traffic. There is a keylogger, uh, pretty simple. Uh, browser password stealer and the um, root server on root server of plugins that I just talked earlier. So it's quite typical, uh, like imp implant used to spy on, on a machine. And there is this uh, plugin, which is called delete cookies, which is interesting because for espionage, it's not very useful. It deletes cookies on the victim machine for very specific domain including, so it's hard coded, the domains are hard coded here, mail.ru and td.com, and as you might know, td is a Canadian bank, so why would Tretector want to, to delete cookies for a Canadian bank? Um, so we think that this, uh, this plugin is, in, is aimed at deleting authentication cookies so that the victim has to re-authenticate uh, to their account, and then if they run the keylogger at the same time, they can grab credentials. But like this td.com doesn't make sense if you target uh, diplomats in Eastern Europe. So let's go back a bit in time. And I found this uh, blog post by uh, Train Micro and that says that it's a group that targets US and Canadian bank customer. And if we scroll down a little bit, we have this uh, um, nice figure. And as you can see, the infection step ch chain starts with a XLS file with v uh, VBA macro. Then we have a auto key downloader that can download additional scripts. So probably sounds quite familiar. And then we scroll down again, and there is an example of, uh, of a plugin. So this one is a browser password stealer. And if we compare to uh, the plugin called Passwords that we that that we found in our espionage campaign, it's actually exactly the same thing. So it seems that the toolkit used in this Threat Micro article from 2020 is the same that was used to target uh, government staff uh, last year. So is it a Kramer group that switched to espionage during the war? Actually not, because uh, we, we, did, we dug into older campaign and we found, we found that since 2020, Azalem and Busquet have been targeting uh, government officials and people working in state-owned companies, uh, mostly in Central Asia and also Armenia. So it means that they have been doing uh, cybercrime and cyber espionage since the beginning of their operation. Yeah, so uh, I answer to, to the question. <laughs> a bit early, but uh, yes, they do cybercrime and cyber espionage. We also noticed that, so at the beginning of last year, they were mostly doing cyber espionage, but then starting October 2022, we have started to, to see more and more cybercrime campaigns. Um, we, we found around uh, a bit more than 4,000 victims uh, since the beginning of uh, 2022. And as you can see, most of them are located in the US, Canada, uh, and also a bit in, in Europe, as you can see, Germany. Uh, but what is interesting is that there are also 
quite few victims in Russia. Yeah, so we counted more than 4,500 victims in uh, January last year. And interestingly, there is a big spike of infection uh, almost uh, once a month. Uh, so these are the, the latest one we observed wa was in early March. I didn't observe anything like another campaign since that time, but maybe they completely changed the toolkit. I'm not sure. And most victims for cybercrime campaigns are cryptocurrency traders and also small and medium businesses. I don't think they are specifically targeting like anyone um, in just random uh, small businesses in US and Canada. So how is the uh, um, malware delivery for the cyber crime campaigns? So they mostly use a traffic direction system uh, to redirect targets to malicious pages. Unfortunately, in our telemetry, uh, we did not observe how people landed on the first note of the TDS, but open source reporting suggests that the attackers are sending, sending spear phishing emails with links or PDF documents uh, with links to these first nodes of the TDS. And it's also possible that visitors from compromised websites are redirected to this TDS. So it's an example of uh, a, cha a chain for this TDS that I found on urscan.io. So the uh, target will first visit the, the website localkitchencodes.com. Um, then they will be redirected to a, a second domain, uh, which is a bit hard to pronounce, so I won't do it. And <laughs> then there is a third redirection to uh, techforsolutions.com. And on this one, there is the delivery of uh, malicious JavaScript uh, files. In that case, it was named document one December some random number dot gs, and it's almost every time the same pattern for for the uh, uh, malicious JavaScript. So it's always like document or notice or something like that, and then the date of the campaign, and then some random number. In some other cases, there are also fake. Uh, so people are redirected from the TDS to fake. Uh, zoom pages, and then from those Zoom pages, uh, if you click download, then you'll also get a malicious JavaScript file. And there are also uh, some for uh, uh, TeamViewer. As you can see, there is some typo, new version, and I think it's written. Uh, it's actually it's not TeamViewer uh, in the title. It's 2V, if I remember correctly. So this is uh, another chain that, that we found with uh, like nakodamachine.com is part of this TDS. It redirected to this uh, documented JS um, uh, malicious script and then it downloaded AHK bot. So this is clearly like part of the Ramon Biscade operation. Uh, but if we look for this uh, domain on, uh, on Varistotal, for example, uh, we can see that the, s the same domain was used to, to deliver like a different like MSC file with jobs, actually a PowerShell script. And this PowerShell script will reach out to download-cdn.com. And this domain was apparently controlled by another cybercrime actor called TA505 uh, in 2020. So it's possible that the domain change ends. But uh, in any case, like this uh, PowerShell downloader, it's actually not part of the Zarya Mobiscade operation. So uh, what it means is that the TDS is not exclu exclusive to the Zarya Mobiscade, uh, so it was probably used by TA505. We've also seen some Qbot distribution for, for from it. So it's probably some paid underground services that, that the group is using to distribute and install the malware. They are probably like paying someone else to, to do some yeah, to distribute uh, their tools. Uh, there was also some uh, mention of uh, Google Ads, uh, malicious Google Ads that redirect to, this, to those malicious websites. So we did not really observe it in our telemetry, but there is a blog post on the Sans uh, website, and you can see like this is fake ads for uh, TeamViewer, and actually it redirects to one of the um, 
uh, fake pages that I mentioned just a few slides before. Um, so in, in any case, either like the TDS or the malicious Google Ads, they lead to uh, a JavaScript file, which is a bit obfuscated, um, but we can like reconstruct the URL and actually it will call install product to download a MSI, to, to download and install a MSI from, from this URL. So probably uh, the Alarm Ambuscade was providing this MSI and even the JavaScript was controlled by the same group as, as the TDS. If the target executes the, the GS script, it downloads the MSI package that drops this VBS downloader. Uh, and again, it's similar to uh, Sunseed or AHKBot. You can see that it gets the C drive serial number and then does a HTTP GET request. In this case, it will not download uh, VBS script, but uh, download and install uh, another MSI package. Um, this MSI package can contain, for example, a HKBot or a new Python screenshot. And also in the latest campaigns, we have seen a few more uh, plugins for, for the auto hotkey downloader. So this is a Python screenshot. Uh, it's, it's quite simple, like it just uh, take a screenshot and exfiltrate it. Um, also, the feeling how it's it's written it's always similar to in every scripting language. So I believe like one person develops all, all these tools in all those uh, in all those different languages. There is also uh, so if you remember there was this uh, more or less uh, hidden VNC, but now they have something that they call HCMD, and actually it's a reverse shell uh, written in Node.js. Why not? Uh, and um, yeah, uh, actually there are a few functions, but the goal is just to, to execute uh, some, some command with cmd.exe and send the result back to, to the CNC server. And there is a new password stealer. Um, it will, uh, and what is interesting is at the end, so they download and execute uh, another like executable, which is downloaded just here. And what is interesting, there is some common in Russian s saying that here it is not known what the function should be written. So it's probably reassuring to see that they don't really know what, what they are doing. And the last one that they have added, probably because they started to really uh, uh, compromise more and more uh, like uh, companies, is that it's this script to, to gather information about uh, the Active Directory. Um, so they execute a, a bunch of, of comments like NL test or net group domain computers slash domain extra. And then again, they exfiltrate to, like this part is very similar in, in all plugins. And what comes after? Of course, Cobalt Strike. Um, then w after Cobalt Strike, we haven't observed any further activity, but it's likely that attackers are deploying other stages or are reselling the infecting machine to ransomware affiliates, for example, because yes, they can monetize their activity uh, with the password stealers, or I don't know, they can take screenshots and, and uh, get some private information, but I think that they are really monetari monetizing uh, also the infecting machine after. Uh, Cobalt Strike configuration is quite typical, so yes, you have like a domains, nozet.com, I believe they control that. It uses a jQuery malleable uh, profile, and if we scroll down, there is a watermark, and it's non-watermark used by many, many cyberpunk groups, so it's probably some uh, leaked Cobalt Swag Builder uh, from a long time ago. And then, two months ago, they did some retooling, uh, they decided to redevelop everything in Node.js, so including AHKBot. Uh, so this is the new backdoor that we name Node.bot, but it's, as you can see, the same. Get C drive serial number, get request, and then execute the, the results. Difference is that everything is in JavaScript now. And they have started uh, redeveloping 
the plugins uh, from AutoHotKey to JavaScript, so they haven't finished like, developing, redeveloping everything, but some of them are already non done. For example, the browser password stealer. Um, or the screenshotter. Uh, this one, actually, it, it downloads another tool, which is called Irfan View. It's some tools to, to, do, to, to edit pictures, but actually it can be used in command line to, to take screenshots. Um, some other experimentations that we have observed like in March is that they have started playing with a uh, LNK file. Um, so since Microsoft disable uh, by default uh, uh, macro downloaded from the internet, LNK file have, have become some uh, very, very popular uh, l last year among like all threat actors and other among this case is no exception. And they're also starting to play with a uh, .pub file, which are like just uh, ofi uh, um, office file for, for Microsoft Publisher. So as you, we can see here, for example, uh, one of the uh, operator uh, uploaded a bunch of files on various total, probably in order to, to try to, to bypass uh, detection. So we can see at the beginning there was uh, one detection, then a few minutes after five detection, and finally zero detection uh, after 27 minutes. Some words about the attribution. Uh, so there was again another blog post by Proofpoint which was published early February. And so what they, they have named the group here TA866, but actually it's the cyber crime part that I was describing. So now the question is, uh, between espionage and cybercrime clusters, is it the same group or is it some malware kit uh, for sale? Um, so we think it's, it's the same group because the level of activity is, is quite low. We, we counted like a bit more than 4,000 victims. It can sound high, but if the, if the toolkit was shared on multiple cybercrime groups, it will be way higher. And second, the network infrastructure is very similar for all cyber espionage and cyber crime campaigns. Uh, for example, since server are usually located at same uh, hosting providers, so it's likely that a single person manage all this infrastructure. And third, the tool set is rather basic in, in comparison to other crime or backdoors that for sets that we have seen. So our assessment is that it's a as I'm on is a cyber crime group that is uh, doing espionage on the side for, for some, some reason. Like we don't know for who they are working, but they are clearly engaged in, in espionage as well. Um, so lastly, uh, why they will do financially motivated activity? Um, since espionage is not like it's just a few operations, uh, not their main operations. It's unlikely that they use cybercrime to fund the espionage operation, but it's likely that it's for their personal profit. And during our investigation, we found a few hints about the origin of, th of the attackers. So first, in most uh, plugins or most malware they develop, there are uh, Russian strings. And most of the time, like the restraining language is like really good quality. So it it was written by a, a Russian native speaker. Uh, so this one says my number for debugging. So it's likely that these two numbers are the uh, C drive serial numbers of the developer. And also, if you remember the targets of the cyber espionage campaign, it was first Central Asia and then Ukraine and its neighbors. So it really suggests that attackers are somehow connected to, to Belarus or, or Russia because they are like the two main states that are like spying in this region. Uh, so let's conclude this, uh, this talk. First, back to the original question. So are Russian cyber criminals targeting Ukraine and its allies? So yes and no. So Zarya Biscade is a good example of that. It's probably Russian or Belarusian cyber criminals that, are, that were uh, doing espionage in Central Asia, but then they moved to Eastern, Eastern Europe at the beginning of the, uh, of the war. But on the other hand, it's only one of the few, it's only one example, and we, we haven't seen like a very big trend of 
cyber criminals starting to target Ukraine or Poland or such countries. So uh, we should be careful when trying to link every cybercrime incident in Western countries to, to the war in Ukraine. So there are, other than this case, I believe there are cyber criminals doing a bit of cyber espionage. They have a basic tool set, but it seems to work, even against Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And they really like to redevelop the same thing in different scripting language. Uh, we will see what scripting language is next. Uh, thanks for your attention, and we are currently finishing to write a blog post that will be published on our blog, WeLiveSecurity.com, in, in a few weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending. Uh, we are right on time. So what we will do is that uh, before taking any of your questions, we will re uh, we'll bring some chairs on stage and we'll have a panel with Sue and Mathieu. So if you have questions, please uh, ask them. You can ask them over Silo as well. And we will start in a bit less than 15 minutes. So please stay tuned. Thank you again.
with the panel, with our two previous presenters, Sue and Mathieu. So thanks again for presenting. Um, I really enjoyed the presentations. While the topic were completely different, I think there are many things that were similar. Uh, using reverse engineering in technical analysis to understand how attackers or malicious actors are behaving, how they're evolving over time. Um, I think it was also interesting to note that it is likely that both actors are operating from the same region of the world, um, while at the same time the motivations are different, so I think this was really good. Um, the first question I have for you, um, actually we have a couple questions from the audience already, uh, thank you. If you have more, uh, we will have microphones, you can ask them, or you can ask them on silo as well. Um, so that's it. Please, uh, yeah, please send your questions if you have them. But before that, I'll start with two of my own questions, just to warm you up, uh, warm you up, and get you accustomed to the uh, microphones. Um, yeah. So my first question, and I'll start with you, Sue. Um, if you had unlimited resources, and you had to do that research again, in unlimited resources in the sense of both money, but also reverse engineers, contacts in the government, is there anything you do different, or you, you wish you had the resources to do something more? Um, good question. <laughs> um, so, in, so, the thing with the you know a lot of e-crime malware is that I track at work. Um, it's 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 very like unlike APT. You know, it's a it's a lot more widespread. You see a lot of them. Uh, what and and this is also something I touched on the slide briefly. That you know what a lot of these malware use a beaconing style communication. So that makes it a lot more harder to pull down payloads that they're trying to spread. So if money wasn't an issue, it would be actually quite fun to try and infect as many machines as we can and uh, track all these different affiliates and how they, and what payloads they choose to distribute. Because I think that's one thing that's missing in a lot of our industry. So we do track some affiliates, but not all of them. It's impossible. Uh, like you can emulate up to a certain point, but then it comes to a point where these affiliates are installing uh, tooling on the victim machine that requires hands-on keyboard activity. So at that point, emulation is useless and you do need a machine. And, and if they don't find anything interesting on a machine, uh, they're less likely to you know, load anything. Uh, so yeah, money not an issue. In fact, as many computers out there. <laughs> That's a really good answer. What about you, Matthew? Yeah, I think that uh, your idea about having like full environment to see how actors are behaving would be a pretty good idea. Even for APTs, sometimes uh, I would like to, to have that like big Windows domain, like a fake one with a machine with interesting documents, etc., just to see what, what they are doing. Um, this is a good point. Um, and Specifically for my for my research, I didn't have much time to, to focus on the first part, the the uh, traffic direction system. Um, like, if I had more resources, I will definitely look at that to try to find out how these threat actors uh, where they are selling uh, their services, uh, exactly what other threat actors are uh, are using it, and uh, trying to. Uh, to, to separate the, the chain among the, the different threat actors. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's what's missing uh, in the research. Cool, thanks. And by the way, I didn't want to highlight anything that was missing, just more, we always have limited resources and limited uh, time, so um, cool. One thing that I'm noticing in different research teams looking at cybercrime is that um, there is lots of similarities with tracking APT actors, but sometimes there are some things that are harder in my opinion. One of them is to is how we organize multiple researchers tracking cybercrime. In APT, I think many research teams will split between Russian actors, Iranian actors, Chinese actors, maybe North Korea. How do you think teams doing cybercrime research should be structured, or do you have good experience in your own organizations that you'd like to share? I guess I'll go with that since it's cybercrime. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, that's true. I mean, a lot. Even I believe CrowdStrike has a similar structure like that, where APT focus is by country and e-crime is well everything. <laughs> you have uh, like in my case, I work on certain families, and there's some other analysts. They work on it by family basis. But we are starting to notice things like 
tooling that is shared across these groups. And, uh, and then th this does make it a lot more harder. Uh, I mean, as far as it's concerned, I mean, we could place all these, most of these malware groups under, say, one country in particular, because that's where they tend to arrive. But of course, you do see malware coming from other country. Um, I don't think there's any clear solution, but the key thing is to distinguish these toolings as much as possible, and then uh, you have, uh, so from a low-level perspective, and then from a high-level perspective, you have threat intelligence analysts come into play and try and make that connection with how this tooling is used across groups. So I don't think settling with countries is enough because it's clearly not targeted, and it, this is a whole different financial sort of uh, uh, ball game here. Yeah, I think the problem with Cybercom is that it's a whole ecosystem, so you cannot really, you can make clusters, but everything I is connected, so you cannot like work uh, on on something, and it's not separate from everything. For APTs, for example, you can separate by countries, because APTs, they don't collaborate with, with each other. Um, like if you track Russian APTs, they will never, never collaborate uh, with uh, Chinese APTs or North, North Korean actors. Or it, if you work on some APT, you can just work on that, and it has no relation with anything else. So it's it's quite easy to separate the job. Even like we don't really, s we are not or how we are organized. Like uh, in ESET is we don't separate by by countries. Like for example, I work mostly on Russian APTs, but also on, on Chinese APTs. Um, same for, for other people, but we tend to to track like different groups, and one people is responsible for, for one group. And it's very rare that we have to, s someone has to, to collaborate with another researcher because groups are sharing something, except for Chinese APTs, which is a, a, a big mess, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's really easier to to cluster things. Like for example, when I did the Azalea uh research, it was really hard to understand like the the infection chain and the traffic duration system and all this stuff because there are so many different threat actors using like same like same TDS, so it's it gets messy quite easy. That's actually a good point that you brought up, you know, about the tooling, because it reminds me of the Conti leaks, and uh, uh, and not just the Conti leaks, just like a bazaar loader. So when bazaar loader was using the uh, bazaar call type campaigns, a lot of these call centers were opened in India, <laughs> uh, but we know that bazaar loader, the none of those developers are from India, and uh, you know, based off what we've seen in the Conti leaks, so clearly there's a lot of uh, international collaboration here, and it's a lot more, um, yeah, it's a lot more organized than we thought, you know, before. Uh, another good example I have with eCrime is, uh, so for BokBot, or publicly it's called iSID, they use this uh, hidden VNC tool, you know, um, Matthew talked about, like, hidden VNCs. So they've been using this tool since 2019, but now we're seeing that same tool being distributed by Bumblebee, uh, we even see uh, like a catbot using a similar tool, and it's it's a bit uh, it was a bit like curious. It's like is this just another group building this tool? Like where are they getting their hands on this tool from? So clearly, there's a lot of organization happening here, uh, something that we are not privy to. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I would like to, to ask uh, Lily. Uh, you had a question, and uh, if that's okay with you, I'd like to you to ask it live because I think you will deliver it better than myself. Hi, Sue. Um, yep. So a question in regards to Bumblebee. Um, so with the API unhooking module in that particular malware, when it um, detects that um, an API is hooked in memory, so it overwrites that with the bytes on disk. And my question is, what happens if there's a memory pointer at the beginning of that particular API on disk and, for example, in memory. Um, 
would it just write the raw bytes from disk and that memory pointer would be invalid and potentially cause any type of crash, do you figure? What are your thoughts there? Cool, thanks Lily for the question. Um, so yeah, so this was, uh, the, I think it was a slide I just quickly went by. It was a slide that talked about the libsplice, the splicing library that does uh, the unhooking. Uh, so essentially when it's trying to remove any hooks on APIs, it's copying over bytes from the instructions and its physical file. So Lily pointed out the fact that, you know, you might have instructions in memory where it's referencing addresses and that could be a potential problem because does this malware take care of rebasing those addresses? Uh, long story short, no, they don't. <laughs> uh, they just, they don't even do anything different. They just completely use this library as is. Uh, the thing about this library, it is almost a decade old. So it's not something new, not something that was aware of rebasing. So they just copy in and it ran. Like it, there was no problem. So uh, maybe they tested it, maybe not. There's no clear idea why. Um, but it seems to work. Uh, but uh, I believe like also like Lily's done research where we have seen like other families now starting to look and implement those checks for rebasing. So you know a lot of these groups are probably becoming aware of the faults behind some of these uh, hooking libraries. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again for your question. Is there any other question in the audience? Uh, we are now ready to take some questions. Um, yes, please go ahead, and if that's okay with you, I'll try to rephrase your question for the ones uh, listening online. So please uh, step in and correct me if I'm, I didn't understand your question properly. Uh, the question is, uh, in, the bumble in Bumblebee, why are the developers, why did the developers choose RC4 instead of something maybe more efficient or more modern like RC5 or Doublefish? Uh, good question. It's not clear why they've introduced RC4 and RC4 is like this, it's like this go-to thing with a lot of e-crime malwares. A lot of them just use RC4. But there is also a bit of a hidden meaning behind it, uh, and not something I've talked about. Um, so with Bumblebee, a lot of the samples, uh, based on which affiliates is using the malware, uh, each affiliate has their own RC4 key. And so even though it's communicating with the server, you need to make sure you're communicating with the server that can uh, decrypt messages with that proper key. So in a way, it wasn't only just encrypting traffic, it was also used to track uh, communication for certain affiliates. So you couldn't just use any you know, Bumblebee malware and just uh, take the C2s from that malware and just communicate with it. If you don't know the RC4 key that's associated with the C2, it makes it harder to see what the response is. So it's in their way slightly tricky, like unless you have the malware, you can't use it. But I mean, yeah, they could have carried it forward, but they, clearly didn't bother. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your answer. Um, Maybe we can explain why threat actors like using RC4. So I don't really know about RC5 and RC6, but for RC4 there is no constant. So if you compare to AES, for example, in RC4 there is no constant. So it's harder to, to detect RC4 with like a, uh, a byte patterns. You'll need to, to check like the the decompiler who have uh, or have a signature on some some uh, disassembly graph. So that's why threat actors are like using RC4. It's just hard to make a signature on it. Thanks. Uh, thanks for this, this explanation. Um, I'll go with one question we had online for you, Mathieu, which was, um, can you elaborate a bit on the um, what does it mean that there was a watermark for the Cobalt Strike uh, sample that you described? So the watermark is a, a number that that is linked to uh, uh, to the license linked to the Cobalt Strike uh, builder. Uh, the problem is that first it's quite easy to change. If I remember correctly, it's just a number I in a text file in in the root directory of like the Cobalt Strike instance. Um, but generally threat actors don't care about uh, changing it. 
So it can still be useful to, to cluster uh, uh, different uh, um, cobalt strike beacons. You extract the config and then you cluster by, by watermark. The second problem is that there are a lot of uh, cobalt strike builders that have been leaked online. So you can find like cobalt strike builder of like previous versions and a lot of threat actors are reusing those leak builders and that's why they are they they end up with the same watermark at the end. Thanks. I'll continue with uh, questions online. I I like that everyone is able to vote and upvote them so it helps me prioritize. Um the next one I think is for you Sue and the question is could you abuse the beaconing system in Bumblebee to affect the uh, attacker uh, in order to un to infect the attacker uh, in order to unmask their identity? Uh, you seem to be expecting that question. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, unfortunately, I don't have any good answer because uh, uh, you know part of my work is we do not attack back. <laughs> So uh, it, it may be possible, but it's not something uh, you know we are allowed um, to pursue or look forward. And so I just really only monitor traffic, and I will. Yeah, that's it. That's all I can answer to it. <laughs> awesome. I, I think the next one is for you, Mathieu. Uh, did you need to enable macros in Word and Excel and Microsoft Publisher files f in order to get a successful infection? Probably yes. But to be honest, I just extracted the macro and didn't try to didn't try to run the document. But uh, if it was downloaded from the internet, I think for few years now. So before uh, so be before July 2022, uh, you had some some, me some just some message and you can just click to enable macro. Uh, but now it's just not possible to run macro from the internet uh, if you have like up-to-date version of, uh, of Microsoft Office. Thank you. Next one is, is crypto still very in fashion in the crime world or has hype died down like the in the mainstream? And if so, which cryptocurrency, I guess cryptocurrency in this case? So maybe I'll start with you, Mathieu, because I think you did mention that some of the targets for, your, uh, for the group you're tracking were uh, looking at crypto, uh, cryptocurrency. Yes, so we noticed that uh, attackers, they were when they were collecting, like, for example, uh, browsing stories or like doing like keylogging, they were um, uh, very interested in uh, taking uh, credentials to to logging pop to log in popular uh, uh, cryptocurrency ex exchange, for example. So we haven't observed them stealing, really stealing those. Uh, those, those cryptocurrencies, but I guess if they are collecting uh, wallet addresses, uh, logging passwords for crypto exchange, it's just not to to look at the number. Um, and w what was the original question? Not sure I answer the question. I think you did answer the question. Uh, maybe the other part was, uh, is there anything you can share about which crypto exchanges or which currencies were mostly targeted? Mostly bi Bitcoin, if I remember correctly, and like the exchanges, it was very random, so it, it mostly depend on what e exchange the victim was using. Okay. S um, I could expand on that. So it's not with Bumblebee or anything. Uh, this is actually, because uh, I've also been tracking some Mac OS malware, uh, a lot of stealers. Uh, so lately we've been seeing, it's a kind of an interesting question, because we've been seeing a lot of stealers that target gamers and uh, like social engineer gamers through Twitter and to get them to install stealers on their machine which end of the day just steals wallets and an extensive list of wallets and it's all related to the metaverse because uh, some of these games they use uh, cryptocurrency uh, exchanges for you know, trading and stuff so they t look at like um, I, I, yeah, Binance, uh, Bitcoin, this, there was a list and I don't know the entire list off my head, but uh, I think it's more c common in the gaming world. Yeah, for sure. 
Great, thanks for the additional, additional context. This is uh, really appreciated. Um, the next question is something we've already touched on, but I will I will go through it again, and then please feel free to chime in if there's something else you'd like to add. How different is it in uh, studying geopolitically motivated versus uh, the ones created by criminals? Is there a significant difference, or pretty much the same? I'll start by summarizing what we what I remember from what we've discussed so far. Um, I think we've discussed that. State-sponsored attackers are going to be mostly not sharing their tools or techniques. They have their own things, and they, the Chinese and the Russians rarely exchange tools. While for the cybercrime, we see a lot more of exchange and common pieces being used. Anything else that you see that kind of stands out as geopolitical versus criminal malware? I can start if you want. Um, Maybe how malware are developed or prote protected. Uh, like generally, crimeware malware are very well protected. There are like big packers that which are very annoying to to reverse. Um, they do a lot of check like to see if they are running in some virtual machine or sandbox or stuff like that. On the contrary, APT malware generally they are not packed. Uh, very little obfuscated. Like from time to time, like strings are obfuscated, but that's pretty much it. Uh, so of course, from time to time, there is some very big changes that are very hard to understand. But generally, like it's, I'd say, maybe not easier to to reverse because the malware are v very big. Uh, like a lot of functionalities are generally in C plus plus. Like network communication can be quite hard to to understand, but. Uh, they are really rarely use Packer because they want to stay under the radar and looks like any other file on the system. When you have some pack sample, it's start to be suspicious. Um, I guess what I could add to it is uh, e-crime these days, they are a lot more ransomware focused. <laughs> I mean, that's the easy way to make money. Um, it's uh, and of oh, course, oh, if it's targeting gamers, it's you know stealing cryptocurrency. But uh, like gone are the days you see banking trojans and and most APTs don't. Um, I could be wrong. They may be doing ransomware or not, but that's what's clearly defining and what the, you know what defines e crime and APT. Um, and also, I find that e crime they tend to focus a lot more on EDR evasion because they are targeting companies, and companies most likely have some EDR solution, and and they just want to bypass that. And especially with ransomware, you're seeing a trend with the um, vulnerable drivers, so the BYOVD, and so you know they clearly it's uh, they want to prevent EDRs from seeing that they're encrypting files. So vulnerable drivers is the way to go currently these days. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I guess, uh, hope that answers the question. Yeah. I think it does, thank you. Um, I'll start with Mathieu for the next one. Have you seen the situation in Ukraine generally increase malware threat activity? And what do you think those people working on malware will do if the war ends? Um, so we did see an, in an increase of malware attacks in, in Ukraine, but those are mostly state-sponsored attacks. Um, so the people developing those those malware were most probably working from for the same organization before the war and will continue to work for same organization after the war. So not sure if it will change anything. Um, and we did see like some some increase in the context of the war, but it's not like crazy. Um, and in the last few months, it's it's really more quiet than it was one year ago. Anything to add, Sue? Um, I, um, no, I <laughs> think uh, Matthew <laughs> <laughs> answered it well. <laughs> Perfect. The next question is also a bit APT oriented. Have you been involved in nation state APT identification for diplomatic allegations, for example, blaming Russian FSB for attacks? Um, so from time to time we will like s say that the group is most likely like Russia line or China line but we never go as far as naming the entity of the person who, I who is behind it it's quite easy to to make mistakes and it's m more a political job to 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 do that right 
I agree. I mean, yes. <laughs> Cool. And we have time for one last question. It is also a bit uh, politically oriented. How much work is going on with groups blaming each other? Uh, for example, Anonymous Sudan uh, recently was discovered to be actually tied to Russian APT. Is th are there other examples? I can start, Seb, because I see you looking at the sky. I think... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I do remember one case um, of an another Russian operation at the beginning of the war uh, with Ukraine where they changed the um, they changed some of the metadata in some pictures to make it look like it was coming from Poland, but it was very amateurish and not super convincing. So I think false flag operations are not uncommon, but to say if they are increasing or if there are recent examples, um, I would need to ask our experts. Any crime, well, with group blaming, you you normally see a lot of, within the group, a lot of them, uh, there's sometimes there can be tensions. I think that was quite clear with Conti leaks, when something political comes up and, uh, but of course it was a Ukrainian researcher that released the logs, but uh, um, you don't see it too much. You mostly see it maybe among ransomware groups, like especially if there was a ransomware that targeted a hospital and then they, immediately try to post on like the data leak site that it's not them, it's someone else. And so it's oftentimes that, that case because they do not want to be liable and they are you know, actually worried. Uh, but otherwise, like it's hard to, we haven't seen it elsewhere like in e-crime. Um, ab about APT, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe there's a lot more of that happening in that end. I don't think there are a lot of them. Another example was uh, the one in Korea during the Winter Olympics. Uh, I don't remember exactly the details, but there was something with uh, rich headers from like North Korean group, and actually it was like Sednit was behind like the attack, like a Russia line group. Um, it's it's a bit old, so I don't remember exactly the details, but actually like this uh, group Sednit make it look like it was some like North, Cor North Korean online group that was behind the attack. But like it's it's not very common or it's too good and we, we don't <laughs> we don't realize it, but I don't know. Um, okay, so something that came up in my mind. <laughs> so what is, you don't see this like immediately in campaigns, but you do see it in forums. You see a lot of uh, sometimes arguments, sometimes when an author, like some group has developed a malware and they're selling it to affiliates, the affiliates can sometimes backstab or do something that they're not meant to do. There's always rules among them that they allow affiliates to do, not do. Uh, so that is actually quite common in e-crime. And uh, so especially, again, with ransomware, they try to tell affiliates that because of you, uh, you're targeting hospitals, you're no longer part of the program. Uh, but so that's pretty common. Or sometimes you have affiliates that will buy a test build but then end up using it uh, their own way and that, you know, quite uh, frankly upsets the developer and then they just release it or they go into cahoots with someone else. But yeah, so it's a, as long as there's money, there's always something to be upset about. Uh, these are really good examples. Thank you. And we are at time. So thank you very much for your presentations, for everything you've shared, and then for joining this panel. Um, it's great having this discussion with you. And thanks to all of you for your questions.
All right. Um, we're going to get started. I'll let people wander in and speak slowly. Um, so we've got three more talks uh, in this room uh, until the end of the day. And uh, we're going to be doing a couple of questions after each of them. So there is no final panel. Um, so I'm thrilled to be welcoming Sarah Khan to the stage. Um, she's a longtime hacker. Uh, and she spent the better part of 10 years as a software engineer with a keen interest in security engineering specifically. She also had a foray into entrepreneurship. And now for the last five years or so, her main focus has been on cybersecurity, primarily offensive. Her research interests inclu include cryptography, malware, reverse engineering, and apparently cyber warfare. Sarah is currently working towards her CISSP ISSEP, and in the future, she hopes to finally get her bachelor's. So welcome to the stage. I'm really excited for your talk. Just go ahead. Why do? All right. Um, my name is Sarah Kramer. Uh, thank you for coming to my session. I'm very happy to be here. And I would like to thank everyone who's brought me here because I've had to start a straight week. So yeah, here we go. First, a disclaimer. This is uh, muted. So before I get started, I'm solely here on my own accord. And I do not speak on, on behalf of my employer. I do not talk. I will not talk about my work or about my work or who I work for. This topic is very personal and personal only. So I just need to make that very clear. So uh, to get started, a uh, few goals of mine today is to, call is to define and convey the meaning of hybrid warfare and how it's used today. Uh, how, why cyber operations are applied for war or as part of hybrid warfare. How we can, as Red Team and Defense Hackspace, utilize the lessons learned to take care in the context of Ukraine and Russia. And uh, the opposing side of that is by learning how the defensive side can actually work together. Okay, background. A little definition. I'm not going to read it verbatim because I'm just going to give you 10 seconds to read it quickly. No? 10? No? All right, everyone good? There are several components of hybrid warfare. You can see here. So one, diplomatic pressure. Rhetorial interference, migration, uh, actually forced migration, the exercise from Ukraine where they recently deported children back to Russia or to Russia, let's say. Uh, we have, uh, what else do we have? Cyber attacks, corruption, fake news, economic manipulation. my laptop. Whose laptop is it? This happened quite recently. It's still unclear who uh, we can uh, attribute it to, but we can all figure out what it might mean. I'm not going to fill in the – I'll let you conclude what it means. Uh, either way, it conflates everything, and we get to the point where we confuse who's done what and why. Uh, we're going to watch a few clips. Uh, the first clip is um, – a Russian escape killer who's denying, I don't know if you know about Little Green Men, but they invaded Crimea quite recently, or when in 2014. Um, so this is den denial. Oh, can't put it on camera. Okay, sorry, I don't have audio for some reason. Anyways, he goes on to say, uh, basically, we're not there. Why? Why? We're not there? Of course not, we're not there. Well, not too long after, of course, the commander from Russia, yeah, we're there. Of course we are. We actually uh, played with the system, got people to vote, vote in a proxy war, 
or talk to vote. Um, yeah, and so it's it's p if you can get people to choose to vote for you and choose to have a referendum by force, then you don't need to invade them, right? So, so here's a perfect example of plausible deniability. If once you get international community to believe that people voted for something themselves, aka a proxy vote, then there is no engagement, right? So you just, you're invited. You, vote, you voted us for Trump. Another unique aspect of this conflict has been the way drones have been utilized. Uh, more traditional usage of bombing and surveillance, but also uh, so-called kamikaze missions. The types of drones has varied as well, um, both purpose for military hardware and the use of publicly available hardware. The usage of off-shelf hardware has gotten to the point where some manufac manufacturers like DJI have refused to sell to Russia and Ukraine because uh, it might be used in the act of war. This is actually a clip uh, of an example of how they're using drones, in particular kamikaze. So you'll actually see it coming in just a sec. Great. Get on to the interesting part, cyber warfare. So some, so some examples of cyber war attacks in 2022. This graphic is interesting from the perspective it marries kinetic attacks and cyber attacks. So this is on the ground attacks as well as cy in the cyber realm. The magic kinetic of cyber operations is a theme we'll see up come quite regularly. I'll highlight, highlight two events in particular, one cyber, one kinetic. They happen to happen on uh, April 11th. So you can actually see uh, here, right, April 11th. No, sorry, March 11th, my, my bad. So you can see the Russian strikes in Dnipro and then we have the matching uh, government uh, attack in the cyber realm. Cyber work in closely with kinetic operational command often makes uh, for more effective use of cyber capabilities. This is just not relevant for warfare, but also when conducting red team assessments. For example, you will need to coordinate all groups involved with your engagement, physical, social engineering, network, everyone needs to coordinate it together. Your attack must be coordinated, super coordinated. Okay. So these are some attacks that led up. So we, s we they start in 2014, which is if everybody's aware of the timeline, is when basically Crimea was annexed. Um, so we start there, we go for a DDoS attack, and then it goes to active work, target attack, uh, and you can see the succession of attacks up till about 2022, when February was the official invasion of Eastern Ukraine. Um, so we'll talk about two of those attacks. Um, in particular, we'll talk about Netetya and we'll talk about uh, the power grid attack. But first, Russia. So what do we know about Russia? Their focus has been on disrupting society through information warfare and cyber attacks on businesses and critical infrastructure. A uh, Dutch intelligence report suggests that other incidents such as malware and disrupting Ukrainian power supply are probably mainly aimed at undermining Ukrainian morale rather than all out like Ukrainian military objectives. This bolsters the point that Russia is focused on disruption rather than a cyber physical damage, uh, rather on cyber physical damage. But what's quite interesting, right, even though they're trying to avoid like, um, not damage in the cyber realm, they have gone after targets on the kinetic side, like um, hospitals and other targets, like schools. So yeah, it's kind of interesting that way. But there's also this question if they do go, s and the, the one interesting thing about a cyber attack too, as many of you know, is you can't really target as well as kinetic. And if you get out, and this is a theme that we'll see uh, coming up, so a few viruses that you might know, one of the earliest is, uh, earliest uh, that got out of the uh, realm would be Morrison, if anyone knows that, it was one of the earliest viruses that can actually grow. And another one more recently was the WannaCry. After that, and that was based off external blue, which is interesting because it was a shift to Netetia, which is also built off external blue. So Netetia, Netetia is composed of two separate components. 
it's not a blue and mini patch, and the patch that was a derivative of patch uh, malware. It's still a blue with a leaked NSA hacking tool, which exploited a no vulnerability of a Microsoft server message block tool. This is SMB uh, D1 protocol, and it infiltrated Windows systems with outdated security. The NetPetra attack originated from an update to the Ukrainian attack software called Mudok. During the attack, radiation monitoring even at Chernobyl went offline. Several Ukrainian ministries, banks, metro systems, and uh, other enterprises uh, were also affected. Um, I don't know if you know the Net NetPetra, I think uh, hit about 10 billion in damages around the world too, so not just in Ukraine. Um, so initially labeled as ransomware due to a ransom message that was displayed after infection, it was soon proven that NetPetra functions more like a destructive diaper tool rather than actual ma uh, ransomware. The attack came on the eve also of the Ukrainian public holiday um, uh, called Constitution Day. NetPetra was a destructive and spread quickly, but many attacks was also an act of cyber war which is interesting because there was a uh, an insurance company called Zurich that actually denied claims in the hundreds of millions of dollars because they claimed it was an act of war. So it's that one of the few attacks that were actually labeled from the start as a cyber, and it was cyber war. Um, and because the cyber war didn't fall under the purview of the insurance policies, um, yeah, they took it to court, and I think just recently they settled, and I don't know what the settlement because it wasn't made public. Um, so NetPetra overwrites and encrypts sectors of the physical hard drive in the C volume, but it does not contain the ability to restore the files, rendering the recovery impossible, even if the ransom is paid. This is why it was not attributed to ransomware. Using a Windows API device I.O. control, the malware is able to direct, to direct read and write access to the physical hard drive without an in interaction with the uh, operating system. This allowed the code to determine the number of disks and partitions on the system, unmount and mount the volume, even if it was in use, and determine the drive geometry for the drives on the system, the number of sectors, bytes, and base sectors. The malware uses the access to destroy data critical to the operating system. The Petra also had the ability to replace the OS bootloader with custom code embedded in the binary. So the next attack I chose as well because it went after OT systems uh, rather than just IT systems. And so the power distribution company sustained a cyber attack in Western Ukraine on the 23rd of December 2015. Although, although the attack was triggered in 2015, it was carefully planned. Networks and systems were compromised as early as eight months before. In the spring of 2015, a variety of black energy malware was triggered with an employee of the uh, Krikopatia opened an Excel attachment of an email. Uh, if you don't know, Black Energy is a malware uh, suite that was first uh, hit the news in 2014 when it was used extensively infi to infiltrate energy utilities. Its aim was to gather intelligence about the infrastructure networks to help prepare for future cyber attacks. During several months in two summer of 2015, Black Energy malware was remotely controlled to collect data hop from one host to the other and detect vulnerabilities and even make its way onto OT networks and perform similar reconnaissance activities. The afternoon, two days after Christmas, as stated by the operator, the mouse started to move on the uh, HMI system, so that's the human machine interface, and started switching off breakers net remotely. When the local operator uh, attempted to regain control of super, uh, the supervision interface, he was logged off and could not log in again because the password had been changed. Uh, additional malware, in particular to the custom developed exploit, was used to prevent operator from regaining control to the network by wiping out many disks uh, using kill disks, overwriting externals to serial gateway firmware with random code, thus turning devices into basically scrap. But the attack was too fast to allow any reaction, indeed a critical infrastructure environment Operator actions may cause safety issues. Therefore, uh, they really couldn't do anything because um, they have predefined actions in a lot of these places. And so he had the operator had to follow guidelines and to take action. And if those actions don't include such things as a cyber attack, well, you're SOL. Um, this is exactly the thing that happened in Ukraine. 
Um, so it was, it's great to have SOPs, so what we call standard operating procedures, but we also need to account for when those actions arise and SOPs can't handle them or aren't planned for enough. Uh, continuing attackers are constantly coming up with new ways to attack our organizations. Our SOPs need to find a way to adapt as well. Obvious actions could have stopped the attack, but like I said, it's OT and there's really standard ways of doing everything. So you couldn't just, let's say, unplug the system. Okay, so what, what do we know about the Ukrainian operations? Um, this is where my talk really came from because I was really interesting, interested in how Ukraine was expected within days to fall to Russia. Right, so no one expected to be here in 2023, and Russia's or Ukraine's still fighting on both the cyber realm and the kinetic realm. So why? I had I came up with two things in my mind. Um, one was the the. The Russian actions uh, failed to materialize and distribute those attacks, and Ukraine had better than expected defenses. Uh, most Russian digital attacks attempt were directed prematurely or mediated uh, uh, quickly, thanks to far-reaching Ukrainian monitoring, detection, and response measures. Ukraine receives, receives also significant help from Western, both companies and government. Uh, one Center for Strategic and International Studies reported one apparent weakness of the Russian cyber oper operations has been the lack between the cyber and conventional attacking. On a tactical le level, cyber attacks provide benefits when combined with other weapons, including conventional delivery systems, precision guided munitions, unmanned aerial vehicles like the drones, and electronic warfare. Interestingly, Ukraine had a better uh, ability to deploy these mechanisms. The combination uh, can cripple command networks and advanced listening systems and contribute to uh, additional opposing forces. However, when in used in an ad hoc manner or when uncoordinated with air and ground actions, cyber attacks prove less useful. The one area Russia seems quite successful and talented at has been um, what we call you know, information warfare, right? their propaganda. They could go after more physical targets, but they would have to really do it in such a way that's very covert, or covert, yeah. And um, they must do it in such a way that they're careful because the Russia doesn't uh, enjoy the reputation that Ukraine does. Ukraine has this aura about it, right? So they can do pretty much anything without getting into harm's way, whereas Russia, they do something, they get in deep trouble, especially if they start attacking NATO countries. Another part of this, I don't know if anybody's heard of the IT Army, but Ukraine uh, utilizes this IT Army concept, which is a built off of volunteers. Um, it, there's a lot of arguments together, but against it, but we'll get to that quickly or soon. Um, they, there's a lot of theories that they just keep uh, Russia busy while the Ukrainians can focus on their defensive and offensive cyber operations. Any, any other actions is just a bonus. That being said, they do have some standard um, rules, but there has been some criticisms because they have gone after targets that maybe are not just military targets, let's put it that way. And the problem is controlling what people do. So if you have a bunch of volunteers, how do you control them? And much, and uh, but another aspect that we can think about is, if you have a bunch of volunteers, you can also have some plausible deniability of a bunch of volunteers doing stuff. Well, it's not us, right? We're not doing it. Um, so you can re re uh, remain at arm's length and have that plausible deniability. They have used telegrams to organize, and they also have this called MSH DOS. I don't know if anyone knows this library. It actually does like mass DDoS attacks. You're not supposed to use it for nefarious purposes, of course. Um, so the IT Army has these rules of engagement, or um, yeah, the rules of engagement, but um, 
If you work with hackers at all, it's hard to control what they do. So it's better to say, hey, here's a bunch of tools, hands off. And it, interesting, at the beginning of the whole IT army, they were just given them a bunch of targets and here, have fun. Now they've gone to the point where they're using the Sunday dolls to build a bot and you just have to connect with their bot and you can participate in their actions. Uh, uh, as I said before, people were just going after targets and I have heard stories of people actually on their own accord going after things like OT network ICSs and SCADA systems and taking out power plants and various things. But before you do this, I have to say you are might be act in an active war and hacking, and we all know that's illegal, so I have to make that perfectly clear. You do that, you're in deep trouble. Uh, before the IT army, uh, there was an entrepreneur who was also doing some voluntary activities. Uh, some of the tooling, as I said, is the MFA DOS framework, which forms the basis of a bot they built uh, that the cyber army volunteers to use to participate in efforts. Not so shockingly, there has also been cases of Russia building tools and distributing them to uh, partisans, if you will, and taking advantage of them that way. So you don't know maybe what they're doing exactly, and you download this tool. There was uh, some Trojans on it. Planning and launching a cyber attack. Let's shift our focus. We have learned a lot about what's happening in the tactics and techniques, but what does it do for us? Most of us in the cyber world are well aware of the chill chain. By Lockheed, there's also the MITRE attack framework, which is, also, uh, which is more exhaustive, but to the use case at hand, I use the uh, cyber chill chain. Um, Cyber, gen cyber generally doesn't happen in isolation, although the rule has been broken previously, like Stuxnet. Uh, although with Stuxnet, there was a huge component on the ground, is the theory, because they would have had to get all that information prior to the actual event. But this is uh, especially when you're talking about critical infrastructure and other um, OT infrastructures, uh, the, the amount of information that you need uh, is hugely important. Especially when we're talking about critical infrastructure, cyber attacks can have real world, world consequences. It wouldn't take much to cause harm, for example, stopping the water treatment or targeting local hospitals. Uh, sure, there's civilian targets, but let's be serious. Nation states might shy away from reasons touched on already. What about motivated partisan groups or individuals or nation states who don't care about international decorum or laws? Concerning OT systems are widely underdefended and rely on outdated tech. With more being connected to the interweb, it is it's, it's not inconceivable that a bad actor will target these systems and either inadvertently or advertently target civilians. It is shocking that it hasn't happened at more than we've seen already. Attribution would be hard and like many breaches may not be detected for a long time before it's being remediated, like we saw in the Paris Gate attack. Rolling out a series of attacks and making it innocuous enough to not create waves and alert the authorities and true nature and scope of the attack is key. Sure, it takes planning and organization and all that is lacking is a current climate of a motivated party. S staggering attacks would help to hide the true motivation or hinder uh, attribution added some disinformation about who might be at fault and blame the official opposition, for example, of the ruling party, and you're on off to the races. So lessons for offensive teams. Uh, for all the fog and questions over the IT model, Ukraine's creativity and ingenuity could nonetheless have created a model for a new kind of warfare. Drones tracking troops' movements are purpose-built apps like EPO. Uh, EPO is an app for just tracking drones in the air. Uh, Telegram for tracking troops. There's Bellingcat. Uh, Twitter feeds like Elit is another one as well. Brings a whole new meaning to a militia, not just democratizing cyber warfare, but it's democratizing war. Similar to partisan activity in World War II, but with modern communication and tools organizing to mobilize thousands. It would, not be, it would be interesting to look at this issue in more depth uh, with further research. 
Military and other such organizations will learn from the conflict and no doubt shape the future of conflict. It has also provided an example for businesses in indeed countries how to stand and keep running under constant pressure and cyber attack. Countries like the industry suffer from talent shortages. For companies and orgs who can afford specialized units like the U.S. Cyber Command, the Ukrainian model demonstrates a way to develop a cyber capability that can swiftly be deployed. Having training pipeline is critical, preparedness in the primary focus. You might be able to have highly trained teams on hand full time, but you certainly can build a partnership with industry and governmental orgs to build a network of tools and people to deploy when stuff gets real. Uh, reactionary preparedness is definitely not the uh, great approach, but after years of cyber and tech preparation, this type of preparation is often in the norm. Something happens, we react. Instead of pre planning for something that might happen, we let it happen and then we figure out how to not happen again. So, strategic planning. Your team is tasked to infiltrate, uh, so, some takeaways. Um, so your team is tasked to infiltrate a secure building. Now what? What do you know about the building access points? How about when the security goes to the bathroom, changes shifts, for example? Do we know what type of access systems they have? Can we spoof the method of entry? You need to know your enemy and target, no matter if, the, if you're attacking a country or a company. Recon is important in planning your staffs of their attack. We use frameworks for a reason. Run through your plan. I go back to, uh, I, I fight in Muay Thai. When we train for a fight, we train to fight in training. So you win the fight in training. Same thing with this. You prepare and prepare and prepare. You walk through what will happen at each stage of that attack. This is, this is starting to sound familiar. It's not by accident. The interesting thing, even with knowing all that we know, teams and organizations appear to get it wrong more times than they get it right. If you're running an offensive team, take no practice. War games and blue team, red team exercises should not be just the purview of intelligence organizations and military. Uh, but I, I realize that that takes a lot of money, so you can do what we call in the security world tabletop exercise, whiteboard tests, this kind of thing. Walk through everything. There's no reason why an organization, even with three people, can't walk through your attack steps and figure out what your adversary will be doing. Consider who your enemy attackers would be, power plants, Maybe a target by terrorists, banks, by criminals. It doesn't matter what organization you're a part of, you are going to be an attack at some point. Even an insider, a disgruntled ex-employee, for example. It could take time and effort and it could take time and effort to step back and view the system like an outsider, or even an insider who attends no harm. One of the values of a tabletop exercise is to let players consider the system as a whole. Organization, without the idea who is doing what, the flow and tasking of your efforts will be haphazard at best. So we have a CTF going on this weekend, even an eight, eight people team. If nobody knows what each other's doing or how they're doing it or what you're doing, you're not gonna get anywhere. This goes to, uh, oh, well, we'll get to communication. So yeah, so when you're building teams, your organization has to be there. If you can't coordinate, you don't know what each other's doing, it's gonna fall apart pretty quickly. Talent management may not seem relevant, but if you utilize your people properly, no amount of team members will get the task done. Right, we, you can have a thousand people, but if everyone's just sitting around dust bunnies, collecting dust bunnies, it's not gonna matter. Uh, I have seen team dynamics and lack of organizations take down the smallest of teams because people are not sure what to do and leaders don't delegate. Figure out what your people are good at and divvy up tasks. Keep to the chain of command in the event situation. This doesn't have to be your chain of command at your normal workplace, but has some structure in place at the event or at your assessment. But don't forget to listen to your experts, right? Not everyone's security is a huge topic. You can't specialize in everything. Figure out what your people are good at, divvy up tasks, keep to the chain of command. This leads to communication. How do we pass up and down information? And this, of course, leads into the topic of OPSEC. 
Um, so when we talk about OPSEC, there's a well-known story, I don't know if you're a fan of cryptography, but when they broke the Enigma, they couldn't actually use the Enigma to the extent that everybody wanted because what happens when everyone knows what you know, people stop using that tool, right? So um, it's, this is sort of the same thing with cyber. You've got you to gotta plan if you have these attacks and you know you have these attacks, let's say you have a zero day, which I hope nobody has and not keeping it to themselves. But if you do, you would want to use it at once because then that whole idea of having that, people know you have it, it's gone. That, that advantage is gone. So this, the OPSEC applies to both cyber exercises as well as security assessments. And um, so yeah. So one of the other things that th when we get into talking about when to use these attacks is this idea of prob probability and uh, what's called strategic randomness. So again, you've got to use it. If you're going to attack somebody, you've got to make it so it's plausibly that it's not yourself doing the attack. Um, so I lean on this side for so when it comes to Russia, I lean on the side why they haven't done so well as they have is I lean on the side of tactical coordination of Russia's military and intelligence organizations not coordinating. As we know, large organizations often get in the way and are paralyzed by bureaucracy. This uh, one of the advantages I think Ukraine had is this sort of ad hoc ragtag team, sort of that ground fighting attitude. And because they don't have this big organization, but apparently before the, the, all these attacks happened, they didn't really have any cyber capacity within their organizations already. And as we all know, large organizations get in the way and are paralyzed by bureaucracy. Um, so you might, not, you might be in a situation where you might not know in terms of t uh, another aspect we need to talk about is tooling. So you might be in a position where you don't know what you're using in an event. Uh, this happens quite often. You go to an event, you don't know what you're doing, but you'll have a set of tooling. And this is very important to set up your tooling before you go. Uh, a lot of organizations, if you work in a bigger organization, you might not have a choice of tools. So if you're going to an assessment, you might be stuck on something because that's proprietary, that's what you use, so stick to it. It's unfortunate, but it happens. I don't think it should happen because you should uh, use tools to match your task. As always, it's like this famous question of the programming languages. What's the best programming language? Come on. What's the best programming language, right? It's Python, right? Who uses Python, right? Yeah, okay. I don't think so, I'd like C, so there you go. Um, so you know this pain. I, I couldn't make a whole talk out of the scope of the session. Uh, adaptability in, in tooling is something to address. So yeah, don't let your tools dictate what you do. Let what you do dictate your tooling. Before moving on, I would like to address the human element. But fill, the building effective teams is a huge topic, but does need to address briefly here. We must build teams that are mixed and in every way, both in skills and makeup to think like the attacker and to find ways to attack and achieve our objectives as offensive folks. You need, to, you need team members that have different skill sets and viewpoints that complement the team. Obviously the team, obviously the team, obviously you can't have everybody who's good at one thing. So if you have somebody who's really good at malware, writing malware, you. What's the point of having a really good malware person if you can't have somebody who knows how to get somebody to click on that link, right? It doesn't, it's not effective anymore. All right, so unfortunately, I think my time's coming to a quick end, maybe. Um, so I have a few final points just to go over. Uh, never under underestimate your adversary. It is a massive mistake Russia's made and organizations continually t make. Plan for the worst, hope for the best, over plan. Run your worst case scenario of defenders, if on the offensive side, run through your workflow for your attack, both cyber and nine cyber aspects. The Ukrainian conflict will leave a lasting impact on the cyber world. The lessons learned will, all, will be important going forward. And not only at the nation state level, but also for individual NGOs and companies. And um, that's all I have for planned content. 
So I think I have some time for questions. So we do have, we have time for questions. So um, feel free to use the QR code that may or may not be appearing somewhere, uh, such as on the stage. And um, I'm happy to read some questions out. Or since we don't have any yet, uh, if anyone wants to jump in and say something, you can do so. And I will translate for the stream. No questions? Thank you. Thanks so much. Please come talk to Sarah afterwards if you were too shy to ask in front of everyone. We're going to take about a 10 minute break and then we'll be back.
there and I'll eventually do the 10 minute one in the hockey room. Yep, yep, sure. All right, okay, and we're back. Um, welcome everyone. So I'm super excited to have Sushakra Sharma on the stage. Uh, he is a repeat speaker, he's been here before. We know him well. Um, he's the chief scientist at Pravado, where he helps build code analysis tools for data privacy and data security. He completed his PhD in computer engineering from Polytechnic, where he worked on eBPF technology and hardware-assisted tracing techniques for OS analysis. For the last six years, Sushakra has been working on enhancing static analysis tooling for fixing security bugs at scale. And he is also quite a prolific conference speaker, including Norsec. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. So um, thanks a lot uh, for, for this very lofty introduction. Um, you know, but it's just me and my humble mustache, which is here. <laughs> so um, uh, I welcome you to this talk. Um, we're going to discuss a lot of concepts which have not been discussed in privacy before. And I guess it would be one of the first times we are going to do a deep dive into it. And uh, j just let's uh, get into it then. So I'm this guy. Uh, you, you know about this, so no need to read this. Uh, privacy in modern times is uh, actually something like this, you know. Uh, you click yes, I agree, and you sign away your soul, or you burn your money and go to the Himalayas. Uh, so I, I mean, there, there's no choice in between at, at this time. So, um, and why, why do people feel like this? Is because uh, they see a few things. They see the mistakes every day. You know, they see news items like this. Uh, you know, Twitter advising all 330 million users to change their passwords. Uh, a gas state agency in India, you know, leaks millions of Aadhaar numbers. Aadhaar is like a SIN number here, so so it's like that. So, and all of these things, when you go to the root of it, is very basic. You know, for Twitter, it was actually plain text passwords and logs, uh, uh, something as simple as that. Uh, and for this, it was an unauthenticated endpoint which was leaking PII. You could just go and you know, do the increment ID thing and, and you suddenly get all the information. So the other reason is that people know about this also now. You know, they, they did not used to know this, this dark cloud in between, but now they know that there are data brokers who are, uh, you know, you trust a few of the services, you put all your data there. Some services you are, you don't know you should trust or not, but I, I guess, you know, maybe just give some info to them. And then, you know, it goes on, gets into this dark area, and then everything gets collected, and suddenly there is, there is this service which has everything about you. You know, you never even expected this random ABC numbered corporation having all this information about you, because, but they have it. And, and people know about this now. So, so they're worried, they are genuinely worried. Um, it's very difficult to solve, you know, these these problems because there are economic incentives around them. Because, like, you know, for some businesses, they are only going to run if they, you know, take in your data. But some legitimate businesses, they have to actually solve this stuff. So the theater of security and privacy looks like this right now. And and I'll start from the perspective of privacy. We'll see the CISO's mind. You know, it it's kind of like this. It's not blank. We are going to fill this. So uh, I think the first thing is, is, is like this. RSA, log4j, big ticket items, they really are worried about all of that stuff. But then, you know, behind there is something else also in the back of the mind. You know, they are, it's important for them to understand what's going on. So we'll zoom into it. And then we see that they know about some bugs, you know, which are going to own them. Somebody must have mentioned them in some board meeting, you know, a guy walking past. Uh, so they're worried about them also. It's, it's not like they're not worried about it. Uh, and at the same time, there's another human, you know, they know about. And this human is that sharply dressed colleague which they have, and, and they have like the CIPPE, et cetera, on LinkedIn. Okay, this person is the privacy officer, the chief privacy officer. So we, we start looking at their mind also now. Okay. And, and the chief privacy officer is worried about GDPR. You know, you talk to chief privacy officers, okay, GDPR, is, is my stuff GDPR compliant or not? And, or, or like CCPA, you know, and then they also worry about some conferences like IAPP, organizations like that, and then compliance, DSAR, you know, is the data fine? They're worried about that. And then there's this nagging question that they always have. So on para two of a privacy policy, we say that we don't collect precise location, but on the random channel, 
I saw this map of our customers doing SBB bank runs, okay? And people were joking about it. So how did this information go there? So I, I think they are worried about stuff. You know, it, it's, but, but they just don't know exactly how to tackle it. Uh, but there are reasons for it. And, and during my movement from security and privacy and security altogether throughout uh, these years, I have realized that privacy operations work like this. There, there are three buckets uh, of people who touch privacy, essentially. So I think the first is the lawyers on the side. Uh, they, they, they do high-level GDPR-type mandates, uh, very important. Uh, they're more reactive, so they look at privacy events very carefully on, on what has happened, what is going to happen, and they have a very compliance kind of mindset. Are we compliant with this law? Is it, is it fine or not? This is very important for large organization to run efficiently, not get into trouble. Uh, and then they also rely very deeply with uh, security data or privacy operations, uh, which actually own in putting those laws in action. They try to implement what is going on. Uh, you know, they're tracking all the changes, flows to all the data inside the org, pr run privacy assessments, uh, data subject, access request, DSAR. These are all these terms you're going to hear in privacy. Uh, they come from a very uh, safety kind of mindset. We, we have a responsibility to safe, uh, safeguard the data that is coming in. And then on the other side are developers. They are very decoupled from, from other orgs, as, as I have observed. Uh, they are actually, these are the people who will actually solve a problem. So, so if, if some change has to be done in the code to keep the app safe, uh, to implement privacy respecting features in it, it, it goes to them. So, so really the problem, the, the solution of the problem is there. Okay? And, and then a lot of people are revolving around these buckets, uh, gathering or, or not having the developers you know, get into the, mm, I would say, say the same table, I would say. So uh, there are common grounds in security and privacy. Uh, you know, I tried to put them in this nice Venn diagram because Venn diagrams always look cool. So uh, security folks, you know, you can see they care about injection, auth bypass, network stuff, you know, some CV, CWEs, you know, they care about, you know, that path traversal, I guess. And then uh, they also care about some other stuff. Like they care about data security and sensitive data leaks. There's a ho huge whole section about that, you know. Like CW200, they, they care about information leaks. It's not like they don't care about it. But they look at this from their angle, as if it's one of the points inside the thing that we have to fix and, and we are done. Uh, the other folks, privacy folks, care about a lot of other things that these folks don't know about at all, like DSAR, DPIA, privacy impact assessments. You know, So they, privacy impact assessments are run on spreadsheets right now in a lot of organizations. I've talked to a lot of organizations. To folks working in InfoSec, they would think, how can you run a whole thing like this? You know, like a provable thing where sensitive data, uh, like are you recording precise location? It takes like two to three months for them to get this information from engineers. It's, it's, it's weird, but this is really what happens. So they care about this, and there is a common ground that is there. Uh, the goal is that we need to understand that common ground. So right now, the pull is, is too much on the other sides, but you know eventually we are going to fix this. So the conundrum is like this. There's a lot of code. It produces a lot of data. You know, so the data that is coming in all these databases, going from one place to another place, going in the log, you know, getting leaked somewhere, it's coming from code. Code is responsible for that. And privacy operation is like someone with a broom trying to you know, brush this water spilling on, 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 on the surface, you know, it's, it's not going to work. They, they try their best. And going a little bit deep, uh, this is kind of like an example of an actual code where you can see that uh, there's username, you know, it's, it's uh, something that is coming from the user. And eventually, if you look at the code, you will see that it gets logged, uh, you know, in a log. And in reality, what's going to happen, because I've seen some uh, operations inside is they, they go to some 10 databases here and there, one other log service, you know, running somewhere else. Uh, and then some innocent human, you know, who never even cared about it, they have access to it. And they just don't tell anybody, you know, because they don't care about it. But uh, technically, it is bad because, because that's data that gets leaked and it's in front of someone who should not have it. So privacy operations are going to look at many places and trying to understand this. They will look at databases, trying to remove stuff from databases if they find uh, private information there. 
But the reality is that the developer really knows where this data is, how we put them there. So, so there is an opportunity here to try to fix it at the left layer. And this is the whole thesis of this talk. We haven't even begun. You know. So uh, we, we'll begin. And uh, the thesis is that if we can analyze code properly, uh, we might be able to fix a lot of vulnerabilities that are in security and also at the intersection of privacy, so making everyone happy. So the goal is to develop uh, privacy tools for developers and engineers. Uh, we'll see how we can build them. Uh, we use a technique called static analysis, age-old technique. Uh, we'll see uh, how it works. So uh, static analysis is analysis of a program uh, or a piece of software before it even runs, and then predicting what's going to happen when it runs. So it's kind of like magic. So, so that's what it is. Uh, you have to understand a few concepts, sources, so if you look, at the, look on the right-hand side, interesting points where the data can begin. So here is, here is data coming inside this little function. And then trying to track it all the way to syn sync, so tainting it all the way so that you can do like a nice data flow analysis. So these are some, some sort of concepts you'll, you'll have to remember, sources, syncs, taints, and data flow. Um, and you know, like why, why we try to do this is because how humans understand you know, code, we also understand it like that. You, you, when I told you about this piece of code, you started looking in your head about HTTP, then seeing, OK, it goes to location, and then it goes here. So computers also understand it exactly like that. So why not we just leverage this? So, th so that's kind of like the thesis behind this. So looking at the same piece of code, this is how you would think inside your head. You would look at this HTTP variable, you will tag it in your head, you will mark it as source, and then try to see where it is going, and then see it goes to an info, then you try to look at what is the type of this info, okay, this looks like uh, the logger, you know, from Apache Log4j, okay, this is interesting for me, I should start tracking it. So, uh, after this mapping is, has been done, you can ask this question. So this is your goal you know, when you try to analyze uh, software. So find a flow from a variable, which is PII geolocation, to a sync log function of patch, uh, package Apache Log4j. So you might have this you know, thinking in your head, trying to understand a piece of code. And that's what you do mentally. So, uh, so the goal of static analysis is to try to model this you know, uh, using computers. We have been doing this for ages. Uh, compilers have been doing half of this work all the time. So we are just going to leverage that. So why should we do this? Because code is actually the true container producer or mover of data. So why not just analyze data from that layer rather than just looking at it when it gets stored somewhere? So we can find bugs early in the software development life cycle, you know, try to fix things very early rather than trying to be uh, you know, reactive uh, and trying to look at things at runtime. So uh, how do we do this? So before we do this, we'll have to do a deep dive and understand what is even code. Uh, so existential questions like this in computer science can be solved by complex things like this. So uh, I'm not going to go through all of it, but essentially what you need to know is that uh, this is how computers are going to understand this little line, you know, int y equals x plus 50. Uh, it converts it into this nice tree format. Just remember the name, AST. Uh, and then eventually, through this AST, we are able to get this control for graph on the right-hand side, how control passes between different points inside the application, inside the function. Uh, remember, we are not even executing anything. It's just statically analyzing the whole uh, you know, piece of code and trying to understand that. And uh, take a good note at this yellow thing there, uh, orange thing. Uh, so, so that's it, uh, essentially where our data is. So with this information embedded in these nice trees and graphs that you see, uh, we are able to uh, get a dependence tree so that we know that the value of z depends on the value of y, depends on the value of x. So by doing this, you can see where we are approaching. We are eventually building like data flow of, of a complete application. So, but programs are more complex. They are not single lines of code. Uh, real programs look like this. And they have more uh, abstractions in, in, in them. So, so there are class and types which have been introduced. A variable can be a member variable. It can be a local variable. Uh, there is a package now, or namespace, based on what language you have. I mean, procedure, function, methods. I mean, these are all variants of, of things. Uh, so, so we have these new, uh, new abstractions that have been added. And then there is a rela relationship between them. So, for example, this uh, method get patient that you saw before, 
uh, is uh, defined in, in, in this class patient controller which instantiates another variable and the method also contains a, a call which is find body. So you can see programs will become huge you know, when you convert them to a graphical format. And that's, that's essentially what we try to do, we try to achieve. So uh, to embed all this information, an abstract syntax tree, the information about calls, information about data flow, uh, we use an approach uh, of building a graph, like a massive graph which has all this information. And the base layer of that would be an abstract syntax tree. So j it's a tree which has all the little, little information about, uh, for example, here, you know, x uh, plus 50 equals y. So, so this kind of information is embedded in a graph like that. We'll have that information of the whole code embedded as one of the base layers. And then we enhance it. We try to build more information over it. So we have control flow and data flow information over it. And then eventually build more information over it where you know, we can have a human kind of question that we can ask. OK, give me all the methods which have patient in their name. So this kind of information is now embedded because we have this nice graph. This whole thing is called as a code property graph. Uh, uh, a colleague of mine invented this. You can go on the Wikipedia article and you can read about this. Uh, so, so a big graph, and it's a queryable graph. You can query it and ask questions. So uh, languages, different languages, whatever code is written in different languages, that's front end. Uh, and then the front end uh, you know, creates this nice graph. And then you can query the graph using a query engine. So in real world, it would be like how, it would, how you can operationalize this is, is, is there's a Java app you have, and then it converts to this graph. And then you have this question a human-like question that you had, you can ask this question, and then the graph returns an answer. It says, okay, I found one flow. You know, starts from HTTP, ends to the first parameter of info uh, on this line, on this file. So you have a lot of this information embedded uh, completely in it. How we can use this? So what if we could run thousands of these queries on millions of lines of code? Okay, it's not AI, it's just it's just simple stuff, okay? We are not gonna do a lot of LLM AI stuff. It's very simple. Thousands of these queries formulate these nice queries and run this on millions and millions of lines of code. It's gonna throw out interesting flows which you can see, uh, which are provable that this data went from here and ended up there. So that's essentially the uh, way, way we can solve this. And uh, to do this, we build this tool called Privado Scan, uh, which starts scaling static analysis and, and tunes specifically for privacy. Uh, Privado Scan is open source. Uh, you know, there are three components of it. There are three repos, Privado, Privado Core, and Privado CLI. Uh, there are rules which are defined in nice YAMLs, very easy to uh, remember, very straightforward. Uh, the engine, uh, it, it generates the CPG, converts these rules to actual queries, so these millions of queries, and then runs these queries on a on, uh, you know, lot of code. And uh, then you can view the results. Uh, by default, there's a JSON and something on the CLI, but then you can also visualize it on a community dashboard that we have. Um, Privado is LGPL, so you can download and play with this. How does this work? So source code converts to this graph we talked about. YAML rules query, and then results, as I just told you, you get something like this. So five flows where data is flowing from, uh, flowing to AWS S3. So, so you can even embed these kind of you know, uh, syncs uh, in, in the system. So it's flowing to a DB, it's written to a file, and then you can go through the system and understand where the data is exactly going. So uh, you can try this out. Uh, there's a simple curl command here to try this out. You should not do this because, you know, yeah. So, uh, and then you can just run Privado Scan. Um, we'll go to a demo now. Uh, I hope the demo works uh, because we should start praying to the demo gods now. So, uh, system is set up here. It's very simple. I think I should uh, make this a bit smaller, I guess, here. Is this good? Okay. OK, uh, can everyone see this? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, OK, I need two hands, but one is occupied. So the brain has to think. OK, uh, so I have some commands already added. It says Privado scan banking system backend there. Banking system backend is a repo. 
it has some sensitive data, and then we'll try to discover if it flows somewhere. Um, you know, I've already scanned it, so I know what happens, but it's for you to see what happens. So uh, let's run this, and this is, uh, uh, so, so Privado is packaged in, in like a Docker container. So now this is, this is running here. Uh, you can see that, um, you know, we detected that the language is Java, you know, it looks at configuration, it's trying to download some dependencies uh, which might be there. So for example, imports, et cetera, that you do in Java, it's trying to understand all of that. Uh, and then you know, it, it will start parsing source code. Uh, so static analysis takes time, so it's, it's gonna take time, but uh, surprisingly, it's very fast. Uh, I was told that uh, in, in some organizations that were doing static analysis that they used to run their stuff on weekends and then go back, and on Monday they would come with like thousands of things in the list and I never understood how people can do this but you know this is pretty fast for for the uh, size of this code so uh, we ran a lot of passes over this graph uh, people working in compilers would understand what passes are so we ran a lot of these passes over this nice graph and we were able to detect a lot of things uh, related to privacy here so so you can see there there is some data elements so we have a uh, 11 data elements total, uh, you know, one third party and then, you know, two storages and then information about those data elements. So they are also classified. So we have a way to classify those data elements also. Um, you can see we have some passport information, age, phone number, date of birth and where it is going. So for example, date of birth is getting collected in these routes. It's also going to this database, HDFC Bank One. We, we, we understood because there was this information was in the configuration. Uh, for for some play, some things we can we can also detect third parties. So this is getting shared to this fast to SMS thing, uh, you know. And then uh, there is a nice dashboard to view this also. I'll try to open it. Let's see. Okay, so so uh, this is how you know it, it looks. So you have these data elements on on the left side, and you, and then you see data going um, all the way on the right side. So here we can see like phone number. We were looking at phone number. We can see where phone number went. Uh, it it went, it was getting shared to fast SMS. Goes into the storage, and then you can click on code analysis and see this literally line by line how this was going from one uh, place to another, uh, and then you you can see eventually you know you created a URL connection, and then maybe you know the string in URL was fast to SMS, and then that's how it detected that essentially you made a call to that, and the phone number was. A part of that message that went there. So, so this is an this is an example. Uh, contrary to a lot of what people say, I find this thing very interesting. You know, like stuff going into logs uh, is is one of the interesting things that I find here. So uh, that brings me to the end of the demo. Uh, you can try to play around with it with your own um, uh, with your own. Repos also, uh, try with Java, uh, Python is also there. Python is beta, beta at, at that time, at this time, and JS is also beta, but I think Java is working very well, so please play around with this. Um, where do we go next? So I think if, if someone asked me what we should do you know, in privacy, this would be something very golden uh, for me. You know, a privacy policy, very high level stuff that you know, lawyer folks would understand much more better you know with CIPPE stuff on their LinkedIn uh, we want to understand how they translate to GDPR violations you know GDPR or any other uh, law so GDPR is like a you know kind of like a larger term that I'm uh, using for CCPA or any other kind of PIPEDA for Canada so so these kind of regulations which are there so any violation connected with the policy that you already have in your organization and then an actual bug inside the code so so this would be this would be like the golden you know kind of like the holy grail of of uh, getting privacy done properly uh, it's very difficult to do this you can do half of it you can do one piece of it but through and through it's it's very difficult but people are trying um, there's a research paper below you can see see this i mean this this has been talking about a very similar approach, uh, and, and they are also doing something like that. Um, and then, you know, 
find these exact privacy violations and suggest some automated ways to fix them. You know, we can we can definitely leverage uh, AI or, or the advances in AI right now for that. I think the time is there. Uh, the models are just not yet there, but I think they are almost there. Um, and then uh, build a complete organizational data flow, not just by analyzing code, but also databases, APIs, document, or your complete infrastructure. So, so like a large, complete large map of where data can start from, where it can go, just by doing scanning of all these individual components. So till now we have been scanning something, some DB's hair, and then someone looks at a document, puts it in a spreadsheet, sends it to somebody else. A lot of manual processes going on right now. We can do everything by just scanning all of these pieces one by one and then correlating them. That would be pretty interesting. Okay, uh, I think we are almost at the end of this. Uh, so last comment, you know, which I would want to say that if your clothes had as much value as your private information, I can bet some privacy policy would be there, and they won't mind asking you to send them your underwear before you order a cab. I mean, this is the state that we are in right now related to privacy. So, so please take care of your private information. That's, that's all I would say. Uh, here are some additional links for Docs, uh, Rules Engine for Privado. Uh, I, I also recommend you reading the NIST privacy framework. Uh, and not just the security one, the privacy one here. And there's a tool by Microsoft, uh, Data Protection Mapping Framework, which which maps all these different, you know, these, uh, we, we, we all know the MITRE attack framework or, or OWASP top 10, et cetera. I mean, in security, we know this. But in privacy, there's an effort to map all these different um, kind of standards into each other. So that that's essentially what this is. OK. Uh, and so questions. Okay, so um, let's start with, ah, there we go, amazing, magic. So do you think this approach could encourage organizations to retain PII in a dangerous way? Uh, and should we focus on privacy by design? Good question. So I, I, I think this is actual privacy by design. I mean, yes, they, they are retaining your information anyways. You know, you would be surprised to know how much information they retain on you. And you'll be surprised to know that they have no clue what to do with this. So it's uh, they're already retaining it. I mean, there, there's no uh, question about it. And and uh, every time someone says that we are not going to collect this or we are compliant with this, uh, you know, I, I think I can bet. I, I don't know, maybe it's too dangerous. But I will still bet that they have your information, OK, uh, in, in somewhere, in some of the databases. And they don't know about it. So they're not wrong in it. It's just that they don't know about it. But since they are collecting it anyways through these various you know, means, a marketing person came in and then said, I need this thing in the analytics. Can you put it? Nobody else knows about what they asked and where, it, where the data is going. Uh, the better thing is to get to have an understanding that it is going there and then stop it. So, so this, I believe, is a way to do privacy by design, uh, by doing static analysis of code and actually understanding where it, it's exactly going. Does that answer the question? Or I was just going around you know, beating about the bush. We will never know if the person <laughs> who asked the question is actually in the room. Any other questions? I'm not seeing anything popping up yet. Oh, never mind. That is a lie. Uh, so here we go. How slash is it even possible for this kind of analysis to help with the confused deputy problem? Your example of the incrementing ID revealing Adhar's numbers. Uh, can you remind me the confused deputy problem? All right, audience. I don't know the confused deputy problem, so uh, I'm lost. Like, um, if you have a thing that's authorized to like, access an oracle for decrypting something, and it doesn't, it'll just respond to whoever. So like, um, I guess they're talking about if the website is supposed to give you your information, but it's giving you her information, it's still supposed to get, like, the information is supposed to go from the source of the thing. So OK, got it, yeah. So um, so I think 
when you actually do code analysis and try to understand how this information was collected, for example, let's take the Aadhaar number. So, so if you look at the system, you will see that the Aadhaar number was collected in this certain variable. And we see that it went all the way here to, uh, you know, populate this template in this, you know, JSX file, you know, and here it was going. You would actually, uh, you would have a complete flow of where the data went to. And if in between that there was no check or authentication, you can actually prove and find it that this was missing. This uh, authentication was missing, so this person is not authorized to view it. So you can find it. But if you didn't, uh, I mean, obviously, the flow is supposed to be there. It's, it's, it's a data that came from somewhere and, you know, is, is supposed to be shown on the site. Uh, but if it's not authentic authenticated, you can prove it that this was not authenticated, so it's a violation. Okay. And we've got another one. Let's see. Uh, won't companies actually want to stay away from tools like yours so that they can keep claiming that they did not know? 100%. 100% like <laughs> they want to be away from us as much as possible. Uh, but 100% they will be slapped with like, you know, $60 million fine, you know. Because like last week there were three, uh, uh, you know, um, in, in EU. So EU is very strict on this right now. You know, last two years they have they have started you know clearing court cases which had been pending for quite some time, and uh, they are going to get fined. So it's the same thing that happens in 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 cybersecurity. So you know, like fear-driven fixes, which should not be there. People should intrinsically be motivated to not leak information, but they don't do it. So the other approach is they'll get fined, and then they will come to us to either detect where the issue was there or, you know, bake privacy by design the way it is supposed to be. But I, I would not be too pessimistic about it because I'm interacting with a lot of companies and, and they are, uh, you know, really coming to us from an engineering perspective for the first time. Never experienced this. Like somebody, uh, a large organization coming to us and saying, oh, we know that all of this stuff is fine with us, but we actually want to bake privacy by design. So it's, it's, it's a new thing, you know. And privacy by, design, privacy by design and these techniques being pioneered here itself in Canada, I mean, it's, it's a big thing. All right, going once, going twice. All right, I think, I think that's all we got. Thank you so much, Sushakra. Okay. Appreciate Thanks your time. be back for the next presentation which is the last of the day well there's the uh, North Sec 10 years panel and then there's a cocktail but the last in this room
All right, we're good to go. So we're going to get started with the uh, last talk of this track. Um, so we've got some guests today who came from halfway across the world. So um, <laughs> on, up on stage, we have Hagen Vardanian. Uh, he's the CTO of Red Rays, and his expertise includes protecting vital business applications, including ERP, CRM, SRM, banking, and processing software. He's a well-known authority on enterprise application security, including SAP and Oracle. He's published many vulnerabilities and speaks regularly at conferences across the world, as we can see. Um, and special thanks to these folks for, for making it here. Um, and uh, as you can see, the youngest team member uh, is over here and really awesome. So. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you so much. Um, uh, hello. I'm excited to share my presentation with you today, uh, which focused on the vulnerability chains in the SAP softwares. And today I will demonstrate how to possible to escalate privileges in SAP and jump from on-premises networks to the SAP clouds. Um, uh, here is the, oh, sorry. Um, here is our agenda, and um, I, I think it will be help, uh, help you to understand the flow of our presentation. Um, my name is Fahagen, I'm CTO of Red Race, and Arpine, she is a CEO of Red Race. Uh, a few words about Red Race. Uh, Red Race is a research and development center in Armenia. Uh, we founded two years ago. And since uh, 2021, we discovered over 50 zero days in um, enterprise software, especially SAP, Oracle, etc. So what is SAP? Uh, the SAP is a multinational software corporation uh, that specialized in er enterprise softwares uh, developing, including enterprise resource planning softwares. And um, ERP softwares is used by businesses uh, Mm, of all the size across uh, all industries to manage their uh, today operations. Okay, um, a short story of the research. Uh, last year, one of our customer requests us um, to mm, analyze their uh, SAP landscape. Um, the SAP landscape was very hard, but here I. I wanted to show very simple network structure. Um, the customer gives us an access as a regular user in the user space. And the request was, uh, hey guys, is it possible to find out some vulnerabilities or is it possible to get information from SAP Cloud from the user, uh, user environments, user network environments, right? So we started to analyze, and first of all, we built this map. As you can see, we split the map uh, by three parts. The first one is a user environment. The second one is on-premises SAP servers environment. And the third one is a um, SAP cloud environment. Um, the end users uh, didn't have access to the SAP cloud directly. Uh, so they have connection only to the SAP servers on a premises network, right? But the main components was a cloud connector that was connected to the SAP cloud and was connected to another SAPs in on-premises. So it means that if you if, if would like to compromise the SAP cloud or get information in um, SAP cloud, we should compromise the SAP cloud connector, right? But uh, to compromise the SAP cloud connector, we, can, we, we should compromise the SAP servers. So we need to jump there, there, and in the cloud. OK. Um, when we are compromising the SAP servers, usually uh, we can um, have four type of access. The first access, it can be admin user in SAP application. And the second one, we can get um, access to the SAP database. Uh, the third one is um, vulnerability or access when we can read uh, application, uh, uh, we can read files from the SAP application using some directory traversal, just for example. Or uh, we can execute some code or command in the SAP servers. Okay, um, before we 
will will um, I will demonstrate the vulnerability. I'd like to mention that all the vulnerabilities has been discovered by Red Race during the that assessment. Uh, only except one, the CVE from 2021, we just arrested it. Um, uh, and all the screenshots uh, that I will demonstrate, I will show you, it's from Red Race demo server. As, as you are, I think you can understand that I can't uh, show the screenshots uh, from our customer servers. <laughs> okay. So first of all, we analyzed, we scanned the SAP applications. <laughs> And as the, our customer was uh, from gas and oil industry, we saw that he used SAP manufacturing execution model. The SAP manufacturing execution model is, um, is using in many, many industries. And uh, the, the, the ME, SAP ME model is a Java application that is deploying in Java uh, stacks, application Java stacks. So, uh, as the Redress is a partner of SAP, we could download that component and we started to analyze to discover some vulnerabilities there. Um, we had a low, pr low privilege user and um, we, during the research, we found Vemo Delio.gsp file in the SAP ME component. And as you can see from the this line, um, this GSP script is receiving file path, um, some file path parameter, and mm, using file path parameter value, he's reading the file and he's printing that content of the file in the page, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, the payload of the execution is here, and uh, I'm showing this, pay this payload here the first time after the fixing. So right now we have uh, access to the SAP application server as, um, I mean, we can read the files from the SAP application, okay? Then we need to try to escalate our privileges in SAP to uh, get access to another levels. The privilege escalation number one. The main thing is that SAP stored some critical information in the file system. And on the, this screenshot, you can see two files, sextor.properties and sextor.key. Uh, sextor.properties file uh, contains in encrypted mode application admin password and GDBC connection string with username and password. As we are in the SAP cybersecurity industry over 10 years, we know the encryption algorithm. And of course, we know we have the key of the encryption. And the encryption algorithm is a triple dash. We decrypt it, and we got the SAP admin application uh, password here, and GDBC connection string, okay? So right now we have uh, admin user of SAP application, and we could connect to the SAP database. So what th what's next? We need to, but if you remember the network map, map we should compromise the SAP cloud. We try to escalate our privileges again. Um, we escalate privileges by two ways. I will show you here the first way because the second way still is not fixed by SAP and I could show it. Um, here you can see, uh, we analyzed the exist other vulnerabilities um, and we found CV 2021 from 2021. And as you can see from the screenshot, the for executing this vulnerability, you need to have privilege uh, high, but we already have it, okay? So if the SAP admins is not updated this component, it means that we can execute this vulnerability also. Um, again, we download this component, we made a diff and we found that the SAP fixed the vulnerability in handle safe function by uploading some file. And they are checking .gsp in lowercase and .gsp in uppercase uh, file extension. Uh, a small tip, uh, tip and trick from me, uh, if you have 
some Java application and you are trying to upload the GSP file and the Java application is telling you, hey, you can't upload the GSP, try to upload with upper cases. It can be work. Um, using that information, we of, of the vulnerable servlet name, function, and others, we built the proof of concept. And again, I'll, I'm showing the proof of concept first time uh, after the fixing. And uh, we sent that uh, th this the following HTTP request to the SAP server, and it works. It it works. Sorry. Um, here we can see that we executed the tasks list command, and uh, we can right now we can execute the mm, command in the SAP servers. But if you see the screenshot on the shell script is not displaying the username of soft processes. It means that the user which running our shell script doesn't have enough privileges to show that info, right? So what what we need to do? We need to escalate privileges again. Um, after um, we um, we started to analyze the SAP processes by Process Hacker, and uh, we discovered three processes um, that um, running under system user. Okay, um, for us interesting was the following processes: SAP host exec and SAP OS call exit files, uh, processes, sorry. Um, we use the process monitor for uh, tracking the activities of that, that, that processes. And um, we started to analyze and we started to mm, tracking what kind of file they're creating, executing, modifying, etc. And we saw that there are a few activities, but the most interesting was that the SAP host exec process, this one, uh, is executing every two minutes SAP CIMB dot process dot, dot process. After analyzing permissions of that file, we found out that many user, uh, sorry, any user from the operation system of SAP server could delete that file and write file by this name in the folder. So what we did, we built, we created a shell code in .NET, built and uploaded to the Windows machine. The shell code was open the port, uh, should open the port 4444, listen any interface, and when he received the commands, he should execute that command by CMD. Okay, we upload that file and we re replace the sapcimb.exe file. And it worked. The SAP host exec is executed uh, our shell uh, file. And I don't know why. I don't know wh what was wrong, but our shell file was has been signed by, uh, by SAP SE. Maybe it come from SAP. Maybe it's uh, back in uh, process hacker. I need to investigate. But you can see the uh, in the screenshot that our shell script has been signed. So after the executing netcat, uh, netstat, sorry, you can see that port has been open, and we sh we, we could connect to that uh, shell and execute it with my command, and yeah, we are system. So that's it. But. Um, Again, you remember that we should compromise the SAP cloud, right? Um, we need to jump to the from the one of the SAP ser SAP servers here from SAP Java to Cloud Connector. Uh, to do that, we decided to uh, dump memory of uh, LSS process. Um, our customer said that we couldn't, as we are system, we could disable the uh, Microsoft antivirus and used Mimikaz there, but he said we couldn't disable the antivirus. We couldn't extract the dump to our uh, Windows machine to analyze that dump. So uh, we 
had another way only. Uh, we downloaded the um, C sharp mini dump from the GitHub and build that program to dump the process, uh, the, the dump memory of the LSAS process, right? But of course, uh, this program is detected by antivirus and by, by any antivirus included Microsoft antivirus. So we try to modify that file, uh, the, the source code of the sharp mini dump. We modified it, we replaced some uh, strings, we replaced strings by chars arise, uh, we compiled again and uh, we again has been detected by Microsoft antivirus. And you know, the bypass was so beautiful, we just uh, set some file extension uh, to we we used file extension that is not uh, has been registered in Windows machine, and we executed by cmd slash c mini dump bypass ms dot exe dot pp, and it has been executed, and he dumped the password and hashes of the processes. Okay. So uh, after that we had the uh, admin users and password from application and from uh, operation system. And right now, we should jump to the mic uh, SAP Cloud Connector, sorry. And you know how we jump? Uh, it was so easy <laughs> because um, in the last cape, there was over 100 SAP servers and the uh, SAP admin set uh, the same password for all the SAP servers landscape. So we jumped to the SAP Cloud Connector. Um, we connected to SAP Cloud Connector by SSH and started to analyze the system. As the SAP CC is based on the page Tomcat, uh, the password was in users.xml file here. Uh, in hashed mode, in hashed mode. So we continue to analyze the system to get other ways how it's possible to discover the password. Um, we found SAP SSFS file. The SSFS it's a modern SAP um, a secure storage, and um, which we, we should try to decrypt this secure storage. Um, after some researching um, of SSFS structure for SAP CC, we found uh, that uh, the SAP CC SSFS contains the following properties, should contain the following properties. But um, the encryption algorithm has been written in binary files and reversing that binary files can be take a long time for us and we Choose another way. Uh, we w uh, so that there are lib sap scc 20 gni.so file, and that file had one exported function, uh, sex store access get record. And what we did, we just used that so library as a uh, native function here. We use that uh, function in our mini Java code and um, as argument we passed the properties that we discovered. This one and this one and we got the password for Java key storage and admin uh, password for uh, the SAP Cloud Connector. So what next? We open the SAP Cloud Connector UI and log in there. And right now, we can manage the SAP mm, connections. We can move the traffic from the cloud to our servers, or we can move traffic from on-premises systems to our, to our another server. And we can manage the traffic, we can listen to the traffic, we can discover some private info, etc. Um, so, as a conclusion, 
you the SAP admins should install the SAP security nodes that we discovered and uh, they shouldn't use the same password for SAP um, operation systems. They should use different passwords for different systems. I know it can be so hard for the admins, but it's the, another w is the, s is the one way for protecting <laughs> the SAP servers for password reuse attack. So that's it. Thank you. If you have any questions. All right, folks, you know how this works at this point. Um, priority to anyone who submits via Slido. We'll also give it a couple minutes. And uh, if anyone is feeling brave, you can also ask and I will repeat the question. As I refresh. It's supposed to be real time. It's not that real time. Okay. Anyone with questions? I'm gonna call it a day shortly. All right. Um, I guess we, we're done in this track for the day. Thank you again so much. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you. And thanks for walking us through that. That was excellent. Thank you.